Charter Commission meeting of May 3rd, 2021 to order and ask the clerk to take the roll. I'll take the roll starting with Barbara Marshman. Here. Christina Johnson. Here. Elizabeth Monley. Here. Ali Matsumura. Here. Enrico Callender. Frank Mapesi. Sure. Sure. Eric Percival. Uh, here. George Sanchez. Present. Lee Tran. Here. Jeremy Barus. Present. Jose Posadas. Here. Glenn Diaz. Linda Lazat. Here. Luis Brosio. Luis Brosio. Magnolia Siegel. Maria Fuentes. Here. Linda Amy Robledo. Here. Gary Segura. Here. T. Tran. Present. Veronica Amador. Here. Young Zhao. Here. And Frederick Brer. Here. Um, we have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to take a motion to approve the consent calendar. So moved. So moved. So moved. <clears throat> Mr. Tran, second by Commissioner Modley. Uh, clerk, take the roll. We'll start off with Barbara Marshman. Uh, yes. Christina Johnson. Yes. Elizabeth Monley. Yes. Ellie Matsumura. Yes. And then I'll call everyone that's absent one more time just to make sure. Enrico Callender. Frank Mitsky. Yes. 
Garrick Percival? Yes. George Sanchez? George Sanchez? I see you're here. Oh, I think there might be a little bit of a connection problem. Yeah, we can't, we, I saw your mouth move, but we can't hear you. If, if you're voting yes, can you give us a thumbs up on camera since we can't hear you? Megan, go ahead and move on. Okay. Hui Tran? Yes. Jeremy Bruce? Yes. Jose Posadas? Yes. Len Diep? Linda Lizotte? Yes. Luis Barrosio? Magnolia Siegel? I am present and we're voting on the prior minutes, correct? The consent calendar, yes. The consent calendar, yes. Thank you. Maria Fuentes? Yes. Sammy Robledo? Yes. Sherry Segura? Yes. T. Tran? Yes. Veronica Amador? Yes. Song Zhao? Yes. Thank you. That motion passes. And Mr. Sanchez? Oh, uh, George Sanchez. Did you have a vote? Were you able to maybe raise your hand? Yes. I also, this is Tony. I want to note that um, Louis Bro, Luis Barocio is now on. Yes, Luis Barocio is on, and yes. And Sanchez is voting yes as well. Um, visually, it's trying to make this audio connection work. Okay. Um, thank you to the clerk. Um, at this time, we're going to, uh, I have one um, report from the chair, and that is I'm going to call on the city attorney to speak to uh, commissioners giving their opinions in public. This is a reminder of the, um, the, uh, the work that the city attorney of Costa Rica training that Peggy talked to us about at the beginning of our beginning uh, of our commission, and we just wanted to speak to um, that issue again tonight. Yeah, good, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that, um, you know, unlike some other commissions uh, in the city, this body is not uh, limited um, in what it can and cannot say publicly, but we have advised for the purpose of avoiding serial communications and things like that, that um, individual members' opinions, uh, if they're expressed in public, um, uh, should be avoided. Um, uh, that way we avoid any issues with the Brown Act and, and violations of it. Thank you, Alex. And that we want to make sure that the public believes that this is time to hear Sanchez, I think, is trying to communicate. Um, just as a reminder that we um, we want to make sure that the public understands that we are um, in the process of studying these issues and have an open mind and and are not making a decision at this time and so that we want to make sure that our civic engagement is not a you know predetermined um, thing as long as we're making sure that we're in avoidance of the Brown Act violation as well as being um, make sure that our public opinions are stated in ways that they may be your individual, but not as a commissioner, and that we really want to make sure that the folks in the community believe that uh, this is an open process in which we are studying the issue, and then we'll make recommendations, in which the public will be able to give us input and for us to make final decisions around. So thank you to the city attorney. Uh, now I'd like to call on the clerk just to report in anything to us. 
I, I'm having a little problem with my audio, so let me know if there if you have any issue. Um, I have a, a couple of things to report. One, we did have a resignation from a District 10 representative, um, Dan Bazzuto. He um, submitted his resignation this morning. We've contacted the council member um, for a new appointment. And last Tuesday, the city council gave budget approval for many of your recommendations, not all of them. They approved translation and interpreting. So we'll have those prepared for the next meeting. It was not quite enough time for me to get things set for this particular meeting. And then um, they did not approve outside council. So we'll actually talk about that under the work plan. Um, what they wanted me to lead a discussion with you guys on why you think you need outside council. So we'll talk about that under work plan, not under reports and information. Thank you. Um, now let's move to our guests for this evening. The first study session uh, tonight will be guests from um, the city of Detroit, Michigan um, and the city of San Jose's Office of Racial Equity. Again, because of the time delay, um, whether it's time difference, uh, we wanted to start with our um, friends coming to us from Detroit, Michigan. So I'm going to turn it over to Lawrence to um, introduce our guests and thank them for joining our commission this evening. Uh, we will take about, um, they will be presenting for about, um, our total time is about 90 minutes. So they'll be making the first set of presentations and then we'll have commissioners um, speaking in terms of questions for them, and then we will move to um, public comment. Uh, Lawrence, do you want to introduce our guests? Of course. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good evening, everybody. Uh, really excited to have with us today uh, three folks who were part of the, who are part of the Detroit Charter Commission. Um, we have with us tonight Denzel McCampbell, uh, Commissioner on the Detroit Charter Commission, as well as who I've spoken to, and uh, I want to thank uh, Denzel for his uh, help coordinating our guest tonight. Uh, he has uh, um, graciously brought along uh, some of his colleagues from the, the Detroit Charter Commission, uh, Carol Weaver, the chair, as well as Lamont Satchel, who is the general counsel. So uh, they are going to share uh, just a couple thoughts uh, from their perspective uh, as part of the uh, Detroit Charter Commission. There are some differences. They have a three-year tenure. Um, they uh, their um, their recommendations go to the state for review. Um, so it's a little bit different, but I think their process is going to be really enlightening. And I hope you all have a, a chance to really get into some of the questions that have been coming up recently around general counsel uh, and equity. Um, but without uh, further ado, do we have uh, Denzel and Carol and Lamont on uh, as panelists just yet? Megan and Tony, I'm assuming that uh, you are, are kind of set us up with that. So I see them in the attendees section. I see Denzel and Carol. All right. Woohoo! The power of Zoom. Uh, the Great. internet connects us all, uh, not just Zoom. And uh, I see Denzel. Uh, and great. All right, uh, I'm going to uh, get uh, formal here and, and welcome Mr. Campbell and Mrs. Weaver from the Detroit Charter Commission. Turn it over to you for your thoughts. Um, will um, Mr. Satchel be joining us tonight? I thought he would have been on. I don't know. Um, there have been a lot of moving parts uh, <laughs> here in Detroit. We just heard from our uh, governor. All right. And so, uh, well, <laughs> oh, and well. So we are, he is working <laughs> see. on a response now to help us try to, she sent us an 18 page document of, um, of her review and of things she, uh, she'd like to see a little differently. So we are, um, working diligently, and I've given him a deadline of Wednesday to present <laughs> to the charter so we can go to our subcommittees and um, review it and uh, see if we're going to make changes. Understood. Well, um, 
let's just say we have until about 630 for, for the two of you to share your thoughts uh, about your process. And then we'll do about 45 minutes of questions for commissioners. Oh, wow. uh, don't, don't feel, uh, if we have that many, um, but don't feel okay. obliged to, uh, to, to take the full 15 minutes. Just would love to hear your thoughts about your process and anything you'd like to share for this commission um, as in the way of um, words of advice. Okay, well, thank you for having uh, Commissioner Campbell and myself. I am Carol Weaver. I am chair of the Detroit Charter Revision Commission. Um, on in, in November of 2018, seven, I'm sorry, nine of us were um, elected to the Charter uh, Commission. And uh, when we were elected, we were sworn in, I think about nine days later. And um, at that meeting, I was selected, elected as chair of the uh, of my peers. And um, let's see, we started off a little contentious, we were all just, you know, just trying to uh, get to know each other. And um, I thought it would be best if we um, started off with identifying committees. So, you know, as you know, the charter is the law for the city and it was the law for the city of Detroit. So I thought that we needed to go over each and every department that was in the charter. So I sat down with each commissioner and asked who would like to chair which committee. And they let me know. And I would just read if, if you uh, are so inclined, the different committees that we have. Our first committee is budget and finance and that monitors the assets, liabilities, revenues, and expenditures um, of the charter commission. Next, we had the personnel. We, uh, the personnel committee was to interview candidates for positions and recommend, it, and recommend applicants to the, uh, the whole body and to oversee the commission work. We have had an executive director, but he is no longer with us. And we have a general counsel, we have a researcher, and we have a, well, we had an administrative assistant um, up until about a week ago, but, and, but now we are hiring uh, media to help us to, um, to uh, campaign for the charter, to, to, get the, to educate the, uh, the citizens on the charter. We Carol, had can I just ask a quick question, um, yes. a clarifying question for this commission. Was there any specific direction that was given to your commission when it was, was founded? How did the, the commission uh, start? What, what was the, the, the purpose for the commission's inception? So the purpose was the, uh, for us coming together. So we had a 2012, we were just coming out of the bankruptcy. We had a 2012 charter and they made uh, a, a number of changes to the charter. And so they put on the ballot in 2012 that if approved, the citizens of the city of Detroit would have six years from that time, a question to be put on the ballot, would you like to open up this charter and review it? And more people said, I think about 700 people said they would like to open the charter. So we put it on the ballot, we ran for uh, a seat on the commission and nine of us were selected. So that's what happened. Great, thank and, you. And so when I, um, became chair, I thought that uh, it was best. I was trying to bring the group together. There was no direction from anyone. And so I thought it best that we uh, kind of take the lead from the 2012 charter. And so what they did, they had a number of uh, committees and I just duplicated that. And I just decided to um, ask each commissioner which one they would like to chair. Okay, and so any other questions on that? No, thank you. I just thought it'd be helpful to have a little bit of context about how your commission was a little is different than this commission. As as you may know, this commission was was created by the Council of San Jose to investigate a, a few different topics. Um, oh. But uh, so um, uh, this commission has a, a bit more direction. Is actually in the process of of coming up with subcommittees. So um, this is a good time to hear from from you all about okay, your process. Great. Yeah. So we had the Rules, Planning, and Structure Committee, and that was to oversee compliance with the bylaws and to propose changes in the bylaws for consideration and approval from the whole body. It was to oversee the compliance with the um, commission's flight plan. 
and to make any proposed changes in the flight plan. Next, and then we had um, the actual departments within the city. So we had a public agencies and safety committee, which um, Commissioner McCampbell is over and they over and, and they were to uh, look into airport, fire, I'm sorry, building safety, engineering, uh, fire, municipal parking, police and a board of police commissioners, uh, the Department of Transportation, Department of Appeals and Hearing, the De uh, Detroit uh, Area Aging, no, Detroit uh, Area Regional Transit Authority, the Wayne County uh, Health Authority for Detroit, the Public Works, Public Lighting, um, the Water Department, Health, Homeland Security, uh, and I'll let <laughs> Commissioner McCampbell go on and on. And after that, we had the internal and external departmental uh, operations that looked at the, at the city council, the city clerk, uh, our district courts, the uh, civil rights inclusion opportunities, um, human resources, general services, pension and retirement, the appointed boards and commissions, the mayor's office, the election and election office and the elections commission, the law department, the technology department, board of ethics, cable commission, board of review, um, inspector general, media services, ombudsman, auditor general, the division of the chief financial officer. Then we had the Economic Growth and Development Committee, which was the Planning and Development Empowerment Zone, Workforce Development, um, just a number of the different authorities that we have within the city. So our next subcommittee was the Neighborhood and Community Service, which we took care of our, of which we had our youth, seniors, disabilities, arts, civic center, library, human services, historical, senior citizens, radio patrol, cultural affairs, museums, recreation, um, the zoo, neighborhood districts, neighborhood associations and block clubs. Then we had workers' rights committee and that was to address all the pertinent issues pertaining to employment and contract with the city of Detroit. So I had, um, after I, selected the chairs for each of the subcommittees. I asked the chairs if they would then ask a, a up to three commissioners, no, no more than three. Some of them had two, some of them had three on their, uh, um, on their committee, invite the commissioners to be on the committee. Um, one reason why I did that and I, and I did not select the members because I wanted the chair of each subcommittee to um, to have a good working relationship and to build a relationship with the um, with, with with their members, and so we did that our first couple of weeks, and we started having our meetings. And so what we what what we did, we said we were going to have a operational plan, which was our flight plan. So originally, we wanted to have um, a revised charter um, on in November of 2020, but that did not happen. We had some hiccups early on, and um, but we did come together and we created a flight plan. Our first stage was our public hearing phase and which that was our education and digesting input. Uh, the commission had a series of public meetings where the commissioners learned various topics addressed in the charter. Our meetings were scheduled to address individual topics. Expert and community um, activists were invited to present on each topic. Um, we probably had around three to four different presenters each meeting um, from community groups to uh, various department heads. We, did we have any elected officials? I don't think we had any elected officials, but it was basically the, the community and some departments coming and bringing their ideas. Some community members even came together and, and, uh, and the groups were called focus groups and they would meet outside of the commission and then come back and, and bring their findings. Um, 
meetings were held throughout the city. So there are seven districts, um, council districts within Detroit. And so we made sure that we, we, we met at each um, district. We most of, most of the times we used our recreational centers. We had recreational centers and we utilized those to have in-person meetings. Um, we are now virtual because of COVID, but pre-COVID we were um, around the city. Um, following each topic presenter at the full commission meeting, the committee of the whole, the pertinent subcommittee met and they digest what they had heard at our um, committee meetings. Then the subcommittee would discuss and agree upon recommendations to be presented to the full commission at a later date. Now, should I go on? Does anyone have any questions or should I go on? Commissioner uh, McCampbell, did you want to chime in? Let's, yeah, let's pause before we open up for questions. Okay. But I think it's a great context. Um, I'm curious if Commissioner McCampbell has anything to share. And I, in our conversation, uh, Commissioner, you talked a little bit about the, the value of focus groups for um, understanding um, community um, uh, sentiment uh, around your work. I I'm, I'm, would love to hear a bit more about that too, in addition to what uh, the chair shared. Absolutely, and, and thank you. Thank you all for having us here. Thank you to Chair Reaver for um, uh, sharing as well. Um, and good evening, everyone. What I will say is that you know, what we and the commission and, and commissioners had, had continued to have a commitment on making sure that we were as participatory as possible in this process, right? Making sure that we um, heard as much as possible from residents, as the chair said, from uh, experts, from the departments and, and the heads of uh, our independent uh, departments as well to ensure that we were making sure that this charter was inclusive of the issues that folks were facing and the solutions that community members um, shared. So what I wanna put forth to folks and, 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 and talking about well, we try to, again, address the issues that are impacting folks, right? Um, I chair the public agents, public safety and agencies committee. And you heard the vast range of uh, departments and issues we covered from policing to water, um, to uh, fire, uh, to our public health department, right? And during this time, as you can imagine, um, as we see the conversations that we're having around policing, as we see how uh, 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 the conversation around access to clean water, um, as we're seeing in Detroit in our charter, um, in the 2012 charter, the current one for our health department, it does not list anything for health department. It just says that the, the mayor may have um, folks to buy some more health and, and, and um, sanitation, right? It connected those things. So we, we invited folks in to say, what are the issues and how do you feel that they should be addressed, right? Because we truly want this charter to be one that residents feel that they have a part in and one that addresses, again, the issues that they're facing. What I also put forth for folks is that this, we had, as the chair said, we had this listening phase um, and you had folks come in and share their thoughts around it. But then we had folks to actually put forth their own recommendations um, to revisions of the charter. And, and that was a large, uh, it was a, a, we had a large time period for folks to submit recommendations. And then the subcommittees that the chair mentioned, they, uh, we went through each proposal. You know, we went through and discussed it and said, okay, this is something that we could look at to fit into the charter. It's appropriate for the charter. So let's see what would be best to fit in. If it was something that was not appropriate for the charter, we still had the conversation to say, oh, okay, well, we will make sure that this gets forwarded on to the city council or the administration to address this. Um, so it was really, uh, I wanna stress that it was a, a process that invited and involved a lot of public input. Uh, we had very, various community organizations who work on these issues day in and day out because you know we I, I, I have a great set of colleagues, but I think each one of us would say, we don't know everything on every topic, right? So we wanted to make sure that we have folks to lean in on those issues. Um, around the focus groups, I mean, you, I believe uh, there may be on our website, but these fo the focus groups came up with, I would say a large package of information on the research that they did, the conversations that they had with folks 
They looked at other, for example, we had um, folks to look at our civilian oversight, our police commission. They looked at commissions across the country. They looked at research around that. They looked at best practices and then came to the commission to say, here's what we recommend for our city. So I really just wanted to really stress that, that community aspect. Um, and I know you all have a different process than we have uh, because our charter will then go to the uh, a vote by the people. Um, but I still will stress that process for you all because um, it, it will make sure that folks feel that they are a part. I know um, uh, the chair mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, the intention to make sure that folks have um, feel that this is a process that invites everyone and their viewpoints in. That's what we try to achieve as well in our process to make sure that folks knew that we were listening to everything that they brought forth and that we actually want to take action on what we as a collective felt best for the city. So I, I wanted to put that forth as well. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Chair Weaver, any uh, additional thoughts from you before we open it up to questions from uh, San Jose Charter Commissioners? Could I ask, I, could I ask um, Chair Weaver, if yes. you all could talk a little bit about your product. So you went through this incredible community process, but then you came up with what I think is fairly unique in this charter review governance question, and you came up with a, a bill of rights, if you will, or a, a set of a document that really is asking Detroit to do something very different. And I'd love for you to talk to us about your product and, um, and that, because that to me is a, a critical piece of information that we'd love to hear about. You mean our, our draft that we have? Yes, ma'am. The draft charter. Uh, I'd like to uh, defer to um, Commissioner McCampbell because we really have some very progressive um, revisions and most of them came from Commissioner McCampbell's subcommittee. So Commissioner McCampbell, can you just share some of the, I mean, we just have some amazing, some amazing uh, revisions. So if you could please share those, Commissioner McCampbell. Absolutely, thank you. I, and, and I would say, you mentioned um, to the chair, you mentioned the Detroit of Bill of Rights. I, I do want to touch on that for just one second. Um, we had a, a, a few council members and, and uh, community organizations build, uh, come up with a coalition and what they did, they looked at various areas of the city governance and the issues. They looked at water. They looked at their environmental justice issues. They looked at um, policing and the militarization of um, our police. They looked at transportation and green space and recreation, right? They looked at, um, um, well, I'm trying to make sure that the, the immigrant rights um, and they looked at disability rights, right? And so they really took a look at all of the, they had an inclusive process and then they brought forth this, they submitted the Detroit Bill of Rights as a proposal, a revision to the charter. And what I can share about this charter that now we have a draft, our final draft of, is that what we did, and I can touch on a few things. I'll touch on water for uh, example, uh, first. In the city of Detroit, um, we have had a, um, I would say on a Nash, on a, uh, on, I would say a large scale uh, problem with water shutoffs in the city of Detroit. Um, a lot of families have gone without access to water. And you've had a lot of folks put forth um, proposals um, to ensure that folks have access to water and also have affordable rates. And um, Detroit back in 2005, actually adopted a water affordability plan, similar to what we see in the city of Philadelphia. But what the city council approved that, but it was never put into place. And advocates continue to go back to the city to say, hey, you know, tens of thousands of families are facing water shelves. We have to do something about it, right? And we got to the charter process and they put forth this water affordability plan, which says that we understand that folks want to pay in the system and we want folks to pay into the system, but we also want this to be an affordable rate for families that no family should go without access to water. So what we did, we put into the charter, a water affordability clause that says, one, you cannot shut off water to folks, especially if they are, um, have children in their home, if they are facing, um, if they are impoverished, if they have folks who have, uh, um, uh, uh, um, impacted uh, health or anything like that. We put those revisions in. But we also said, you know, we have folks who cannot pay their water bills, 
So, but want to pay, but they can't pay because they have large uh, late fees. So we said, we, we want the city to come up with a plan to address that, to ensure that folks have water. So that we have a very a progressive water affordability piece in. We also said, you know, our police force, as we see across the country, you see police forces become more and more militarized. And, um, and they're doing this through the 1033 federal program. So we said, actually, our police force is not a paramilitary force, right? We want them to be a community police department and, and to build those relationships with um, folks in the city. So actually, we're going to put limitations um, on the uh, militarization, the ability to accept and um, receive donations of militarized equipment uh, for police. We also strengthen our over, civilian oversight of our police um, and, and make sure that folks will have a robust complaint system if they put it in and that they have folks who will actually get back with them. Detroit is at the, um, was one of the first cities, uh, if the first city to have a civilian oversight um, body or our board of police commissioners. But we, we got input from the commission itself and community members on how do we ensure that the commission has the tools that they need to be that true oversight body and also be responsive to the community. So we put those things in, in, in place as well. I talked on health and, and mind you, uh, to remind folks, we were taking up these proposals as the COVID-19 pandemic started. So we were talking about access to water while the top, it, the top thing that folks were being told during COVID-19 were to wash your hands. And we knew we had families in the city who were not able to wash their hands. We also were going through this while we knew that the charter did not provide much of any direction on the health department. We have a health department and, and the, the, the administration has come up with a form of a health department. But what we said, we said, okay, we actually, no matter who is the mayor, no matter who is the city council, we wanna make sure we have a robust health department that addresses physical, emotional, and, and um, um, mental health of our residents. And, and we put forth a, a robust uh, health department there, but to also um, ensure that the uh, accommodations and, and restaurants and, and nursing homes and um, long-term uh, uh, living facilities had the oversight that they needed also. We also have put in, um, like I said, we have a civilian oversight of police. We put in a civilian oversight of our fire department. We have folks come to us very concerned about there not being um, oversight of uh, a fire department who has quite a bit of um, a budget and um, assets as well. And then I, I don't, want to, I, I definitely want to get to more questions, but just to touch on um, some other revisions, we. The chair, chair Weaver mentioned that we went through bankruptcy in the city of Detroit, um, the largest municipal bankruptcy in the country's history. And we saw that in the effect of that bankruptcy, we had um, pensioners really impacted by that. We have folks who had dedicated decades of their lives to the city and in one action, their pensions were cut. So we have folks who put money into um, pensions and, 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 and put 30, 40, 50 years into the city. And then now we're faced, to, um, faced with poverty because of no fault of their own. And we put in protections to, on the, uh, for pensioners in our charter. We put in protections on uh, what we call wage standard boards to take a look at the wages across the city, not to um, impose wage floors or because we're, we're prevented from doing it by state law for preemption. But to say that at least there's data out there to look at the uh, the environment of wages in the city, so there there can be some action around that. And finally, what I'll say, we we made sure where I was going on the bankruptcy. The bankruptcy really impacted the ability to enforce the charter. It it, it gave bankruptcy, and we have an emergency financial manager system. That's a whole nother session that I would need with folks. But um, that what um that really took away local control and local and our ability to control our local government. And in that process, they suspended a lot of things that were in the 2012 charter. So what we put in the charter were clauses to ensure that our charter was enforced and that our corporate count, uh, our, our corporation council, who was our city's lawyer, actually enforced our charter because we're not seeing that currently. So I, I, I just wanted to give a view on the way that we try to look at the structure of the city, 
We addressed the issues that are impacting folks in the city. And we really created you know, with the various ways of advisory commissions, a way for folks to be involved in city governance as well. Fantastic. And, and speaking of um, uh, Mr. Satchel, I see he is with us now. Um, Megan or Tony, can you promote uh, Lamont Satchel to um, uh, panelist? And I might want to just give him uh, a minute or two to say hello, and then we'll I've got a stack going here of uh, San Jose commissioners. Hello, Mr. Satchel. Thanks for joining us. Oh, I apologize for my tardiness. It's okay. It sounds like you're a busy man. Out of business. <laughs> well, uh, we just heard from uh, Chair Weaver and Commissioner McCampbell, and um, uh, I think if you have just a, a couple minutes to share your perspective on how you supported the uh, Detroit uh, Charter Commission um, and any recommendations you might give to, to this uh, Charter Review Commission, especially with regards to, to the outside council. And, and, and I, heard, I think I heard Commissioner McCampbell say that you're a city attorney for, for the city of Detroit. Is that correct? Well, I was, um, I'm a, the general counsel for the Charter Commission. I see. Okay. But you're not, you're not employed by the city. Not, no, I, okay, I used got to it. be but not no. I see. I'm okay, no. great. Well, with that, I'll, I'll let you share. Cause I was like, well, muck it up, muck, muck it up. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Lawrence. <laughs> and hello everyone. Again, I apologize for my tardiness. Um, my name is Lamont Satchel. I had the, um, uh, I don't know, I guess the distinction of not only serving for general, as general counsel for the current commission, but for the prior commission uh, in 2008, the 2008 Charter Revision Commission. So I have uh, quite a bit of experience working with um, with charter commissions, and um, I know one of the things you wanted me to speak to was sort of how to make sure there's equity in the document. Um, but I'd like to sort of just quickly talk about the process, which I think is very important. And my recommendation is this, begin with the end in mind. I don't. I assume that your charter has to be approved by the voters. And if that's the case, that's what you need. That's what you need to start yeah. with. I mean, these, these just to be clear, these are recommendations that'll be given to council and then council will decide whether something goes. Oh, well, the, 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 the council will make the decision about whether or not to put anything in place. Not to say that this can't go to the ballot, but this is a, a council driven charter review process. Okay, I guess so my, my recommendation still obtains. I think you, you need to uh, make sure that you craft and put together a document that has um, wide support and input from all of your stakeholders. And when I say stakeholders, I'm not just talking about within city government. I mean, anyone who can be and is impacted by that charter. Um, and I don't know what the process is or, 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 or the format of your, of your charter is, but you have to think very broadly about everyone who could be impacted by it because those are the individuals who will bring to bear the types of political pressure or input to the council to make sure that uh, what you, the document you put together is given due consideration and adopted um, uh, by the by the by the council, um, one of the things that I think is very important to do as you seek to garner the input of of everyone um, is to sort of assign certain people on the commission with responsibilities for certain stakeholders. They'll sort of be the point person for those stakeholders. I think that's very important um, uh, to do that so that. Um, there's always a connection between the commission and uh, and the stakeholders, and there's someone who they could quickly get in contact with if they have any issues or want to um, discuss a matter related to the to that group or that that proposal. Um, the other thing is, I think what you need to do is early on think about sort of buckets of topics and where you're going to place certain proposals that that come in. Uh, organizing the effort is, I think, is very is extremely important. The last commission we had about 500 and something individual revisions, which I know very well because I had to go through each one of them and provide a, an analysis of them. We had uh, about three, four hundred with this with this commission. So it's very important as you uh, begin the process to start to organize a way to review and categorize the different revisions that will be um, submitted. Um, to you. Um, one of the things that we did with the prior commission, and we attempted to do it with this commission, but 
we didn't get a chance to because of the pandemic was we had what we call a constitutional convention, right? Where, um, so our process was we solicited the revisions, um, uh, each, in this case, the current commission, they came through committees. The committees decided which ones they wanted to take for, uh, bring forward to the full committee of the whole for adoption. Um, and things culminated into a discussion draft. So once the, once the commission decided, here are the things that we want, we want to go with, we created a, a discussion draft, which was basically the charter with all the revisions circulated out to all the stakeholders. With the last commission, we after we did that, we had a constitutional convention where we invited um, stakeholders to come in and uh, give their input with respect to the various revisions that had been that had been offered up. Um, the discussion draft is very important, and when you do the discussion draft, one thing I would um, suggest you do is uh, um, commentary, right? Because as some if it, if this is adopted. At some point, if a legal issue comes up as to what was the effect, what was meant by a certain provision, um, courts will likely look to the commentary. We had the case here where the current mayor ran for mayor the first term and he missed the deadline and he claimed that uh, he, he met the requirements of the charter. The court looked to the charter commentary and says it's clear from the commentary what was meant by the language there and you missed it. Um, the other thing is the commentary is very important for purposes of garnering support for what you've done, right? Because you make a change, right? And folk don't know why, why you made the changes. They read the charter. They'll just see that, you know, this, this language may have been changed here. But what the commentary allows you to do is to explain, give the rationale, and the basis for the change. And it's also an effective tool for uh, marketing, if you will, uh, the charter, because as you use that document, as it goes out, it's a way of garnering support and educating uh, the public with respect to what was changed and why it was changed. And I would suggest that you be very liberal in your explanation with respect to what change was made and why it was made. Um, and the impact that you believe it is, it is going to make as a result of, of the change. Um, as far as, as, as um, equity, I think um, one of the things to look at is, uh, and I know we did this with our prior commission and the current commission is, what are sort of, sort of the hot topics of the day? What are the issues out in the community right now that really need to be addressed? Back with the prior commission, we come out of um, some issues with respect to the mayor who ended up being um, going to, to jail. So there was this big push to uh, put in place measures to pre to hold government accountable and to prevent abuse of government. Right, so we end up putting an inspector general in uh, into city city government, an office of inspector general. We made other ethical changes in terms of putting together an eth ethics policy, um, and did other things with respect to removing political figures and appointees from office that they engage in certain practices. Um, with this current commission, one of the issues that has come up is equity in terms of um, race. Right. And so we decided to put together a commission a task force on reparations to look at the issue. What was the involvement of the city of Detroit government in the slave trade and in systemic racism? Uh, we've also looked at issues with respect to affordable housing. Right. Um, and putting some language in there that allows the city government to take into consideration uh, an adjusted AMI that is lower enough for individuals within the city to qualify for for housing, award affordability was a big issue here. You probably have heard about that in Detroit, clearly in Flint, H is up in Flint, but we had a lot of water shut off here in the in the city among um, low income individuals. And it's sort of the perfect storm happened because it happened during the pandemic, right? So you can imagine what the, uh, the backlash of that was. So we put some um, language in the charter that talks about um, affordable water, uh, uh, process and um, programs for water affordability um, uh, and the like. Uh, um, we, we put in language in there with respect to responsible contracting. Make sure that the city government engages in practices with respect to contractors that 
uh, allow for equity in in um, and how they go about contracting with um, outside entities uh, for uh, for the city. Um, there, there's a whole range of things we put in there. The last commission, one of the things we put in was um, there's a big issue in the city of Detroit was with respect to, for instance, um, car insurance. Insurance is just it is it, you wouldn't believe the prices. So we knew at that time that um, uh, there was a legal issue with with putting that in the charter. But we framed it in such a way that we put an obligation on the city government to take every means and every measure to do what was necessary to address and lower the cost for insurance. And it resulted in when the new mayor came in, <coughs> him he going to the um, state legislature and working out a deal where we ended up um, getting very low, uh, lower uh, insurance rates here in the city of Detroit. But a lot of th that would not have happened had that not been a requirement in the charter requiring uh, that, that to happen. So I say that to say this, that, um, uh, and, and it, it, that brings up this issue. You have to decide early on um, what is the nature of your charter, right? Is it aspirational or is it um, uh, more, uh, I'll say legislative, right? And what's that balance? Because if you don't have that discussion, you, you, down the line, you're going to run into issues where folk are saying that's not something that should be in the charter. And you're now trying to defend and think about something that you didn't think about in the beginning, right? So you need to say to yourself, okay, look, <clears throat> have that discussion and hash it out with each other, right? Because some would say it's just aspirational. You just set the framework. Others say, no, 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 no. We can be more specific with respect to directing government to do things that normally would not be in the charter. So to the extent that your charter allows that type of flexibility, I think you have to have that discussion because you're going to run into a situation where, you know, you want to do something and it's not something that you would generally find in a constitution. And so my advice would be don't get caught up on these niceties of, you know, what traditionally a constitution is and uh, a charter. If the charter allows the flexibility for you to, to be more progressive um, and more legislative and, and prescriptive with respect to what you put in there, take advantage of that to the extent that it makes sense, right? Um, now, I'm not saying you turn the charter into a city code, but what I'm saying is you should not be afraid to speak through the charter on an issue that, um, for instance, in our case, we've seen that city councils have been shy to speak to for whatever political reason, they don't wanna deal with the issue, right? Uh, they would love for someone else to deal with the issue. And if it was in the charter, oh, we're forced to do it, we'll do it. But it's something that, nah, they don't want to, you can't get any agreement with respect to, or consensus with respect to the city council to do something. So if there are things like that where, you know, hey, this has been a, a you know a hot button item for 20, 30 years, and everyone's been scared to do something about it, right? And if you think it has the support of the, of, 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 of the voters or significant stakeholders, then I would offer it up and say, look, here's something we think that, that you know, this charter that needs to be incorporated in the charter that you need to, um, that you need to deal with. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Satchel. I'm okay. just gonna step in and um, uh, thank you for your comments. I wanna make sure we have enough time for commissioners to ask questions of you all. Okay. Um, so um, we'll, we'll uh, transition there. And uh, I have a, a, a stack of commissioners, Tran, Siegel and Percival. Um, Commissioner Tran, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and I uh, want to thank uh, Chair Weaver, Commissioner McCampbell, and uh, Mr. Satchel for coming out tonight. Uh, your process is like just, it's fascinating to me right now. I, I've been kind of trying to search just to get some information about the proposed changes. Um, so I actually wanted, uh, I have, I'm going to try to focus my questions just on a few high level topics. Um, in the first, in terms and of- And Commissioner just, Tran, if you could just start with one question so we have enough time for, for more folks and we don't have too much time. So if you could just pick one question to start, I'd appreciate it. Um, okay, uh, well, in which case then, uh, let's start with one question here. The one thing I actually have been trying to kind of determine is whether or not the, the city of Detroit is more of a, a council manager system or a mayor council system. Um, and I, I think I found the answer. Uh, it's not expressed in what I've looked at, but I wanted to get just to verify from you all 
uh, which model the city of Detroit subscribes to? Mayor, city council, strong mayor. Okay. So strong mayor model and mayor, city council. Okay, thank you. Uh, any any follow-up on that one, uh, Commissioner Tran? Or? No, no specific follow-up on that one. Okay, great. We'll come back around if we have time, but thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Siegel. Thank you. Thank you, all the panelists. I have four questions, but I will just ask one unless we have more time. Um, and that is, in your Detroit Police Civilian Review Board, how are the citizens, the civilians, chosen? What powers do they have and how are they funded? I can, I can start and um, if uh, other folks want to lean in. Um, so part of that was our uh, change that we made in this charter. Um, before, there was um, seven elected um, by district, um, and then we had four appointed by the mayor. Um, we, we got quite a few strong proposals to come in to say that folks wanted a uh, uh, elected only police commission. Um, one of the reasons why is that folks saw a conflict with the mayor um, appointing uh, folks to the commission, but also um, being the supervisor and, and um, selecting the police chief. So we made it a um, elected by one per district's uh, seven member commission. Um, the commission is funded through uh, the city's budget, through the general fund. Um, and Leslie, uh, they have they have a wide range of um, uh, functions and duties. One specific one is the investigation of uh, civilian complaints, um, of, of uh, also of any uh, wrongdoing of, um, of police officers, and they also provide oversight of the police department. One thing that we uh, we strengthen in this um, charter is the. Uh, oversight over the budget, the oversight over promotions and uh, appointments of the police chief. So we, we strengthen some of those duties as well. But um, if the chair or the general counsel has any more to add, please do. Yeah, just real quick, prior to 2012, the prior charter commission, the, every one of those members of the Detroit Police Commission was selected by the mayor. Um, when we went to a district system uh, several years ago, we allow for seven of them to be elected, one from each of the seven districts with the mayor appointing, uh, I think it was four, uh, four members. And I remember that because I was pushing that you gotta have, allow the mayor to appoint some folk because the concern was that Lamont may be popular, but Lamont may not be someone who really understands police operations. And so you at least want to have some expertise. Um, apparently that, you know, that didn't work out. So we ended up, changing it uh, in, the, in the current version of, um, of the charter with respect to how they are selected. The other thing that um, is of note is that we gave, um, um, the, we put some, some, some structure and some strictures on the uh, police department with respect to its engagement in certain practices and the use of certain equipment. So now in order to engage in certain practices and certain use certain equipment, um, it has to be approved by the city council pursuant to a ordinance that has to be put in place. So now there has to be an ordinance that has to be put in place and the city council has to um, uh, now in the, you know, in, in, in before the public uh, get an ordinance and adopt um, whether or not a certain practice or certain um, um, practice procedure or, or, or item can be used by the um, the police department. Great, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Percival, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, th thank you very much for, for your um, expertise and sharing your, your experiences with us. I had a question more about process and particularly, um, I think all three of you mentioned different aspects of community outreach. That's something as commission we've, we've talked a lot about, but what, what kinds of things have you learned to be, uh, in your experience, to be effective in terms of getting uh, information and input from community members who might not always be sort of maybe the most active in, in city politics? You know, people who have a lot of stake in what city government does, but, you know, maybe hasn't been as active. How, how did you go about doing that kind of work to make sure you're 
you're having an you know inclusive set of voices and did what kinds of resources did you have at your disposal as a commission to to make that more effective uh, uh, for my fault if you don't mind i can tell what we did with the last the last time and then maybe the, the commissioner campbell commissioner um we can talk about what we've done this time the last time what we did was we sent our stakeholder letters to every conceivable stakeholder in the ecumenical community um, philanthropic community, government community, economic community, every sector. Um, and there are publications and books and that sort of have who these individuals are. And then, of course, the commissioners um, had ties to these organizations, whether unions or whatever. So we sent out, I don't know, it must have been 100 or so different letters to these individuals letting them know that we're engaged in this process. Here's how you can participate. Um, and so th that's one of the ways we did it last time. We got a fairly large input from those various uh, communities. And with this time, um, we sent out emails, but I'll, I'll give an example. For our first meeting, we had almost 300 people. So we have always had uh, a number of people. Um, like I said, we sent out emails. Some people would email us back but really it was the uh, participants that came to the meeting that were um, the, mo the most active. But for you now, since we have COVID and, and everybody's on Zoom, I think it would be if you sent out an email blast, you could have, I don't know, a couple of hundred people uh, on a Zoom call if you wanted. And, and this time too, maybe uh, Commissioner yes. McCann will talk about the focus groups that we had. Oh yeah. Uh, he yeah. did before he came on. He talked about focus. Okay. Okay. I, I think the focus, group, focus groups were essential. I think in addition to what folks have lifted up about letters and emails, the community organizations that I talked about are, are key in getting to those folks that you're mentioning on who may not be involved in city government, but um, I would even say service organizations that, that um, are, are going to folks that whether it's issues around um, uh, poverty, whether it's issues around, or for in our case, it was water, those groups that are working directly with folks on the ground, um, they have those direct stories and also have the direct line to those folks that may get something from a charter commission and say, oh, I'm too busy for uh, to engage, but they, they will either have already talked to those organizations or have um, trust in those organizations to, to get that information as well. And, and quickly, as you categorize the different topics, buckets, as I talked about earlier, that will help you to determine, okay, who are the, will be the people in the organizations most interested in these issues? And so you can start, you can target them, stay on them to, hey, we want you involved in this process. And if they see that there can be an opportunity to benefit them to deal with some issue, more than likely they'll come on board um, and, and provide some input. Great, thank you. So I've got, um... Commissioner Sanchez and uh, Commissioner Robledo, I saw you raise your hand. I don't know if you wanted to share anything. No, okay. So I've got Commissioner Sanchez, Bruce, and Matsumura. I, you know, I was gonna, going to ask about the uh, uh, public participation, the input, and I think that uh, Commissioner Percival asked that question, so it's been pretty well answered. Um, uh, it was good to see how early on uh, you had the meetings at the uh, different uh, recreational centers throughout the uh, council. Uh, uh, districts and uh, and then of course after after COVID then you couldn't do that anymore so so we're trying to see how how best we can uh, elicit public uh, input right now uh, uh, where we're at in terms of, of the COVID era that we find ourselves in but thank you all three of you you've been uh, very very informative great thank you. quickly one way to do that sure. is in the in the different areas pre-COVID you know we could go to those different areas what you could do is you can literally go to an area virtually and just have whoever is the most influential people in the area sort of sponsor the meeting. Uh, and so they can garner the support of the folk in that area in terms of participating in the meeting. Great, thank you, good. Great. Um, Commissioner Bruce. Great, thank you, Lawrence. And thank you to the Detroit commissioners and council for sharing your experience, very fascinating. Uh, you know, here in San Jose, we have a very un unique opportunity to be really specific with our mayor and council about what the needs that we, are, we need for, for funding to help 
um, strengthen the work of our commission. And just love to ask, you know, um, why did you, I guess in the hiring process, why did you choose to go with outside counsel? I can explain that from the prior commission and then I'll let the, the current commission explain that. So historically with the Detroit Charter Commissions, um, they have always just been allowed to hire their staff. And here's why, because it's, it's different here. The, our Charter Commission is independent. They're independently elected by the voters. And so as the Home Rule City Act would sort of govern the process, if you read it, what it, what it tries to do is keep it as an independent body because what you don't want to do is allow for any undue influence by the city council or the mayor, right, in terms of writing the charter. Because in our instance, we determine whether or not we have a mayor, whether or not it's a strong mayor, how many city council people you have. So we have a very powerful position and opportunity to structure city government. So everyone agreed. It was a gentle person's agreement that, you know, we will allow you to hire your own staff and allow you to write the charter as you see fit without undue influence of the um, of the elected officials. And to the extent that we participate, the city government, it will just be through funding you. We'll give you the funding and, you know, leave you to your own devices. And that's the exact reason why we... Um we went with an independent council. Now, uh, our, our um, general counsel, Satcho, he does work with the city's general counsel, but we wanted an independent, and the people, and the citizens of the city of Detroit, let, were very specific. We need our own general counsel. So I work cooperatively as, as uh, Chair, Chairwoman Weaver said, I work very cooperatively with the, with the city's attorney and other folk on the, on the city side um, I think that's very important, but at the end of the day, I know who my client is and what their interests are and what they do, what they want, uh, you know, irrespective of whether or not the city sees that it's appropriate or a benefit to them. But it's very important that you have, that you have folk who are independent providing you advice and giving you assistance in the drafting of it, because there's going to be times when you come up with something that may not be favorable to the city or city council. and there is a potential that if someone who works for them also works for you, you know, you are temporary, they're permanent, they may tend to, you know, be skewed in terms of how they um, interpret or provide assistance to you. So you want as much independence as possible in your process. And, and, and you should establish that early on with city council and have them respect that. It's sort of hands off. You do what you need to do, you bring it to us and we'll objectively look at what you're doing, but we won't interfere in the process while you're doing it. Great, thank you. So next I have uh, Commissioners Matsumura, Johnson and Fuentes. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you so much. Just wanna echo what my colleagues have said about how incredibly helpful this is. Um, I wanted to pick up on a point that Mr. Satchel raised uh, sort of about that aspirational versus legislative approach to the charter. And, and um, it, I, I believe uh, Commissioner McCampbell, you touched upon it as well when you described the process of uh, community members, members of the public stakeholders bringing forward recommendations and then an assessment that the committees had to conduct of which recommendations should proceed to the full commission and belonged in the charter. So. Can you say more about the process and criteria? Because this, this seems like a very difficult assessment of what belongs in the charter um, versus, versus what sh you know, should still be forwarded to city council or the administration, but you know, for other consideration. So, yeah, and I can, I'll touch on it and, and um, then the folks want to chime in. And one thing that I want to, uh, as, a, as a tool that we use, each proposal we, uh, each subcommittee used a recommendation form. And within that recommendation form, we, uh, we would put the proposal. Um, if they had, if there was current language in the charter that talked to the issue that they were addressing, some folks will put in their proposal that they want to amend the session, section of it. They would, some would be a new section or they want to strike. So we will go down and do that. We will also look at any relevant um, ordinances that are currently on the books that spoke to that 
uh, issue, right? So it may be that, again, I think first and foremost, if we saw that there was an ordinance, we would say this is an ordinance matter, it has to go to city council. Um, but we also looked at state law, if there was any state law that governed it and it was not in the city's hand or the county or anything like that or federal law. And then we took a look at the legal aspects of the actual proposal. And that's what we leaned on um, general counsel quite a bit on, on, on how, if it was legal, um, how this would play with the city charter or if it was a city ordinance. And then we did a financial analysis as well. The other thing I would put forward as we were as we we're deliberating in the subcommittee on these proposals, we we tried to take a, 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 a look to say, how can we be intentional on what we're putting forth in the charter, but not be too prescriptive, right? So as you'll see, as I as I talk about the water affordability plan, we put a number to say that we believe that the water for that water uh, bills should not be more than 3% of a person's income, but we leave it up to the city council um, um, and, and the department to create that water affordability plan, right? So, um, we, we put forth in, um, for example, we said that we wanted to have um, an increase in youth opportunity for youth employment, but we didn't put a, 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 a section there to say that the city must hire you. We said that the city should take all the efforts that they can to increase youth um, opportunity. So that was also kind of the framework that we, we went through to say, how can we get to the, the result that we want by encouraging, and as the general counsel said that, you know, a lot of these issues that city council administration didn't want to take action on. So how can we urge that on, but not be too prescriptive in a, in a document that was gonna last for, um, um, 16 to 20 years for, on our end. But if, if the chair and the general counsel have more to add on that. Yeah, well, one thing I'll just, just quickly say is, uh, it, it's very important to, one thing that I did with the prior commission and, and with this commission was put together the form that uh, Commissioner McCampbell talked about, which sort of structured how a proposal would be, re re would be reviewed, right? So we're looking at, okay, what is, what is, what is your, your proposed revision? What laws, whether it's an ordinance or state law applies, right? Do, to the extent that you can cost out, whether that there would be a cost associated with that. And then uh, the other thing that, 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 that we tried to do was this. When you send me a proposal, give me all the backup data and information with respect to that, right? So don't just say, we need to do this. Tell me why, based on what. And also, this was very important to me, and this is something I learned from the last commission that I tried to do with this commission is this. When someone brings me a, 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 a proposal because I'm the one who's gonna have to review them and try to understand them and, and draft around it, tell me what your opponent would say against this, right? Because it helps the commissioners when they're debating in committee and thinking through the issue to understand what will be the opposition to this. And so if they wanna make an informed decision with respect to a revision that they're urging, it's good to know what is, what would the opposition say with respect to this. And so, typically, if I if someone is a supporter of something, they know what the other side is going to say. So, tell me what they're going to say and how you would address that. Uh, it's very important early on that you have as much information as possible when you start to deliberate and think through the efficacy of the revision that you are going to receive, and it should be ingrained and embedded in the documents that you use, so that when you're going through the process, you're forced to think about um, issues a certain way and look at the pros and cons of them and what are the, not only the likely objections to them, but what are the legal ramifications and other laws that would, would, um, would impact that, that, that decision. That, because that's where the work is done. Once, once that's, hashed, that's hashed out, the drafting is a lot easier. I always found that the drafting was a lot easier when the commissioners really thought through something um, and that was something that was a benefit this time because they really thought through the, the proposals. With the last commission, we didn't do committees. So people gave um, revisions and then me and, the me and the executive director sat down and had to do what the, each commissioner did to the pros and cons. And, uh, but it was a lot easier this time because the commissioners thought through each of those revisions through their committees and brought them forward, irrespective of whether or not they agreed with them, right? So, they could bring up every proposal that came, they brought forward. 
But what they did, they brought it forward with a recommendation as to whether or not they should or shouldn't do it or whether or not it needed more work. Um, but nothing was killed in committee. It all came to the full commission. Great, thank you. Very, very helpful. So we have, um, I just wanna make sure we get to questions from Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Johnson and Commissioner Fuentes, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, uh, Vice Chair Johnson. Thank you, Lauren. Um, thank you, Chair Weaver, Commissioner McCampbell, and Mr. Satchel for sharing your expertise and experience with us. Um, so my question is more about um, how do you engage with the public during public meetings and hearings? Was it a standard two minutes? Can you talk more about that process, please? Well, it was a standard two minutes. And I remember one meeting, I think we had over 30 people in public comments and we heard everyone. Our public comments would sometimes go one and two hours long, but we wanted to give each and every person who came to our meetings, who stayed through public comments, a chance to have their voice. And so that's what we did. And we continue to this day. Now, now, now we're on Zoom, you know, we still give each person two minutes. Now, there, now we occasionally will have someone that's handicapped. We may give them a little more time, you know, to finish their statement, but we do give each and every person. And I'm telling you, there have, when we were in person, there would be a, almost a line out the door and we would allow a, every person their two minutes. And um, one thing I'll suggest too is that you be very strategic. I know this current commission was very strategic with respect to when you allow um, uh, public comment, right? Typically, public comment is done after decision is made, right? And so you can imagine public like, well, heck, you know, you made the decision. I can't comment on it. All I'm commenting on is is whether or not you made a good or bad decision. I had no input into uh, the decision because you've already made it. So one of the things that this commission did was um, during the phase where they were adopting, we're gonna adopt or not adopt a proposal, they allowed public comment before that so that the public, public could inform them with respect to those proposals that they just talked about. So they would talk about each of the proposals, then go to public comment, that the public comment on whatever, and then they take a vote. And I think that's very important in terms of garnering public support for the document. Otherwise, what you have just a lot of angry people mad at you for making a decision without their input. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Uh, let's have our last question from Commissioner Fuentes before we need to, to wrap up thank with you. the segment of our meeting, please. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. This, your experience has been really, it's amazing what you've been doing. Um, so I understand now um, your recommendations are with the governor and could you, is that correct? Can you, well, can you tell us a little bit more about the process once the commission um, makes its recommendations, you know, makes a decision on what the rec recommendations are going to be? What happens next after that? Yes, and I don't know what the process is in, in San Jose, but, or in California, but one of the beauties of Michigan is this, the law says this, you have, once the, the commission adopts the revised charter, you have to send it to the governor for the governor to approve it or state her objections, right? Mm -hmm. And if the government, if the governor approves it, fine, she approves it. If she doesn't approve it, but states her objections, then the commission can say, thank you for your objections. We're still putting it on the, on the ballot. So even if the governor deems a certain provision illegal, you can still put it on the ballot and it, it will go into the charter. You just have to fight it if they try to implement it with respect to the legality of it. But what typically happens is once the governor does that, we've just received the actually the objections back. And so we're gonna review them to see where, you know, if there's any merit, legal merit to some of the challenges that, that she raised. And if there's so, if so, then, you know, I'll make a recommendation to the, to the commission. The commission would decide whether or not they wanna accept my recommendation or whether or not they wanna, how they wanna address that issue. And if we decide to, 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 you know, accede to a certain change that the governor suggested, then we will submit it back to the governor for her review. Um, and then, you know, after that, if she approves it, she does. If not, then, we'll, you know, you make a decision. Okay, well, we don't want to do that again because we're under a tight timeline. Let's, let's put it on the, on the ballot. But again, you don't 
we can put it on the ballot irrespective of what the governor does. So excuse me, one more. So then all the recommendations you've been talking about tonight, these will all be put before the voters to accept or reject? But yeah, and in one document. So we offer up the whole charter. It's not we, it's not in the in it's not individual. You, you can do that. Our law does allow allow for that. You can put you can put certain things in the charter and they have certain separate amendments, right? So the charter is called a revision, and you got certain amendments that you can also put on the ballot. Uh, that if approved, if the charter is approved and the amendment is approved, then the amendment would be incorporated into the charter as it was uh, approved by the voters. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Weaver. You were a little surprised that we put aside so many time, so much time for questions. Clearly, we could keep going. Uh, I know this commission has derived a lot of value from from you and uh, Commissioner Campbell and uh, Mr. Satchel. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I think um, I would ask commissioners from San Jose if you have any additional questions to send them my way, if I can compile them and, and, and send them to our guests tonight to see if they, they have some uh, time, additional time to, to donate um, to, to answer your questions, but this has been very valuable. Any closing thoughts from, from anybody? Yeah, if I can, if I can just add, um, first of all, thank you all for have, having us. I think, um, I probably can speak for my colleagues here. Uh, this has been a long process. Um, we've, I know I've learned a lot. I came on to the commission a little bit later um, than where it started. Um, uh, the election, um, I was temp out of the, the, the folks who were running, but someone resigned. Um, and I've learned so much from um, uh, folks on the commission, from general counsel, our staff and, and, and community members. And I'm sure you all, probably have learned so much already and will continue to do so. Um, so thank you all for having us. I just wanted to also, um, just one thing finally for Vice Chair Johnson, um, I wanted to add for the subcommittees, our subcommittees were a place where we allowed a little bit more time for folks to engage um, on those proposals. So as you're thinking about how can we have this robust engagement, uh, um, a subcommittee model will help uh, bring that forth as well. Um, um, also. So I just wanted to add that, but thank you all so much. Um, let me, on the behalf of the commission, thank um, Commissioner McCampbell, Chair Weaver, and Mr. Satchel for being with us tonight. Um, safe trip back to Detroit tonight, and uh, thank you all <laughs> for coming and joining us. I know it's late there, so really appreciate your contribution and your thoughts. And trust me when I say our commission will very much be considering your thoughts and will continue to have you in our minds when we are, as we continue our deliberation. So Thank, Thank you. you for your service to the country. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Have a good night. Um, at this time, I'm going to move us to our second set of speakers, and I appreciate um, everyone taking the Lawrence's cue and keeping us moving forward. Again, if you have questions that you, uh, some of you had uh, other questions, and you might think about what you want um, further. Just a uh, few questions came to my mind in terms of I thought I knew some of the stuff in Detroit, and I learned a lot tonight. So I really appreciate Lawrence reaching out. I was, I was under my direction to say, I really need Detroit to be able to speak tonight. So uh, it was not easy to get this, this evening all organized and scheduled. So I really appreciate our consultant Lawrence in his efforts to make tonight happen in this first part of the study session. Um, there are second set of guests tonight. They'll come to us through a recommendation of this commission and direction of this commission to be able to hear from our, our own San Jose Office of Racial Equity. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Lawrence to introduce our guests for this evening. We've asked them for a much shorter presentation uh, and then to be open up to questions. So we'll have, um, they will be presenting and then we'll have a short amount of time for questions. But since they're local, uh, they don't have as long a drive home. We will have the ability to ask more questions later about them or if we need to bring them back in other parts of deliberation but we wanted to at least introduce them tonight and get us as a commission familiar with our own Office of Racial Equity. So Lawrence, could you introduce our guests, please? Absolutely, thank you, Chair. Uh, really excited to, to have with us tonight, Stephanie Jane and Sabrina Paragasia from the Office of Racial Equity here in city of San Jose. Uh, I asked the two of them to talk a little bit about the work of the Office of Racial Equity and share how they think about uh, equity in the city and, and the, uh, the municipal government. And um, 
uh, like uh, the chair said, I think that um, there's a lot that we can benefit from the work that they're doing and where they see the city going as far as um, racial equity. So I see this as the beginning of the conversation. Uh, I wish we had more time with them tonight, um, but uh, without any more ado, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Stephanie Jane and Serena Parra Garcia. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lawrence. Um... As you all know, uh, we are from the city's newly established Office of Racial Equity. I'm Stephanie Jane. I use she, her pronouns, and I identify as white. I've been with the city since 2016, um, working with the Office of Immigrant Affairs. And I also worked with Strong Neighborhoods back in the early 2000s, so back in the day. Um, I was part of the city's first wave of staff who went through racial equity training through the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, GARE, which I believe you've heard of, um, and am now part of the Office of Racial Equity team, which is led by our director, Suma Maciel, and Sabrina. And I'm Sabrina uh, Parra Garcia, pronouns she and her, and I'm Latina. I started with the city in 2015, working with one of the council offices prior to joining the Office of Immigrant Affairs in 2017. Um, and I was actually in the second staff uh, cohort completing the GARE uh, training in 2019. So now that the Immigrant Affairs uh, group has become a part of the Office of Racial Equity, I am also a member of the Office of Racial Equity. Perfect, thanks Sabrina. Um, we're going to just do a quick overview. I know we don't have much time. Um, four sort of main topics we wanted to try to touch on this evening. Uh, one is, can you switch the slides, Sabrina? Um, one is, what is racial equity? Um, and I know a lot of people have different ideas on that, but really wanting to sort of get a, a baseline on some basic definitions. A quick overview of the Office of Racial Equity and then start talking about some guiding questions around racial equity and how that might apply to the work you're doing with the charter review. And I'll pass to Sabrina. Oh, sorry, Sabrina. That's good. Um, so we are gonna start, we're gonna beg your patience because we're starting from all different places, experiences and races. So we're gonna start with the basics. So if you will allow some grace for that. Um, we. We hear the term racial equity quite often, but we're, you know, what does it actually mean? Um, and, oops, sorry. And this is the definition that we're using right now. And it actually comes in two important pieces. It, the first half about, you know, what does it mean when race no longer predicts life outcomes? Well, that means that black and brown people will be just as likely to own a home, graduate from college, live the same number of years, have a stable living wage job, and be treated with respect by law enforcement as someone from a different race, like a white person. And then the second half of this, that outcomes will improve, improves outcomes for all groups. So this is important because this is about taking care of all parts of our community so that our community as a whole is better off and the individuals within it are also better off. Um, so when we're aiming for equity, that actually means allocating resources towards people and places who are most impacted and most at need until those people or places are on a level playing field with the rest of society. And have to recognize that there are mac macro factors that also contribute to these outcomes Equity is about restoring power and resources to those most harmed by the leg legacy of slavery, uh, colonization, genocide, and other harms like segregation and redlining. So the impacts of these events persist in ways and contribute to the racial disadvantages we see in the data. <clears throat> and this also usually begs the question from people, why should we lead with race? Quite frankly, because race matters. We live in a highly racialized society. Um, we know that some progress has been made over the years when it comes to equity, but if you look at any measure of success, whether that's income, education, health, criminal justice, et cetera, significant differences in outcomes based on race remain deep and pervasive. Data shows across all at-risk groups that black and brown people are experiencing the worst outcomes. So that means black and brown LGBTQ people, um, disabled people, women, for example. So if we are specific about looking at outcomes for black and brown people, then we can also address other forms of inequity. Um, we don't end with race. That's just a place to start if we wanna have the greatest impact because it cuts across 
all other things. And then that leads us to a second point, which is that intersectionality is key. Um, just because we're leading with race doesn't mean that we don't care about or that there isn't room for um, considering other disadvantaged groups across other categories, like people with disabilities, women, um, non-binary or transgender people, those who are in poverty, for example. So the Office of Racial Equity agrees with other, um, that other marginalized identities face disadvantages. Beginning with race helps us develop the framework to address system disadvantaged by other groups as well. Moving on, oh, pretty picture again. So why is racial equity work important? And it says here, systems that are failing communities of color are failing all of us. It's really just that simple. It's that we live in an interdependent society. Um, whether you live in East San Jose or West San Jose, we really are just one San Jose. Um, and what this also means is that the, we're not just eliminating the gaps between white people and people of color, but they're actually trying to increase the success for all groups. Um, this is a concept of targeted universalism, if any of you wanna look it up. John Powell at Berkeley is about this. Um, and now when we're thinking about the second definition we just went over, over um, when outcomes for all groups are improved, I wanted to walk through an example that I think really helps to illustrate that. So <clears throat> one of our fellow GARE trainee cities was actually, they, they had a problem with some of the streetlights. A lot of them were burnt out. And they initially had a complaint-based system. So there were some sections of the city where the streetlights were getting repaired eventually um, because the neighbors were reporting it. But then there were some sections of the city where no one was reporting that the streetlights were out. And there were many reasons for that. You know, maybe they didn't have information in their language or they didn't think the government was going to fix it, or they didn't know where to request it, or they're just so busy, they didn't have time to find the phone number. So many different reasons. But the city took it upon themselves to then change their system to go from complaint based to being proactive about going and finding where the streetlights were out. And that certainly made the situation where the streetlights had been out for a long time better for those residents. But it also was something that the residents who had been reporting appreciated because it meant that they were getting fixed without them having to report them. And it turned out that this all ended up costing about the same amount as what they'd been spending before. So that's really the goal here, um, that the laws and programs designed to benefit vulnerable people, such as those who are disabled or people of color, often end up benefiting all of society. And that is the approach we're using coming in. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, so to provide, some of you may know this already, but to provide just a little bit more background on sort of the, the origins of the Office of Racial Equity. Um, it was established in 2020 and Zuma Maciel was appointed the director in late 2020 in October. So the office is really only about six months old um, and will have approximately seven dedicated staff. And this, the racial equity work actually started several years ago within the work of the Office of Immigrant Affairs. As we were looking at immigrant issues, we clearly saw that these are racial equity issues as well. Um, and, and started then with city staff attending the SCARE training starting in 2018. And we now have close to 50 um, city staff who've completed the SCARE training and are helping to implement applying an equity lens to work in their own departments. Um, but as just to sort of be very specific about what this slide is communi communicating is that the role of the Office of Racial Equity is to enable the city organization to embed a racial equity framework. And that basically moves, includes examining and improving internal policies and programs, again, so that we ultimately improve outcomes for black and brown communities. Um, but let's unpack this a little bit because there has been a lot of confusion about the role of the Office of Racial Equity within the organization. I mean, basically the office can't do it alone. The city is an organization of 6,000 people and a million residents. Um, so our role is really to create the conditions and provide support for city departments who, are, who we are asking to reflect deeply on their own work, to ask questions very differently, 
to make their own changes. Um, and then for the Office of Racial Equity to push the city's thinking on changes that will improve outcomes um, for communities of color in San Jose. One of the ways we like to think about this is that we are an interrupter of the way San Jose has typically done business. So working with city staff in all departments um, to look at data and disaggregate it by race, to think about equity when making budget decisions, um, investing time and resources into truly listening to communities of color in a way that works for them, not just for the city, um, paying people for their expertise, and also increasing things like language access. So these are examples of internal policies and programs. Um, and there's a lot of work to do here and so many examples that we didn't mention that are deep in the work of each department that our that Sabrina and I will never be experts in. Um, and so we are really expecting and trying to equip departments to do that work themselves. Um, the other thing I would just highlight too is that we in the Office of Racial Equity are not a team of experts, but we do ask a lot of questions. And we want to create the conditions that allow city staff to both learn about equity, but also change the way they do things individually and as a system. For those of us who are white or have been working within systems like this for years and years, there's a lot that we can't see at first. Um, for many city staff, we're just, they feel like they're just doing their jobs, but that job is occurring within a white supremacy system. And so it's hard to see that at first. And quite honestly, it's hard to say that at first. But once we help people see it, we can't unsee it. And so that's where the real work begins. Um, basically, it's really our focus in the Office of Racial Equity. It's our job to make sure that racial equity is everyone else's job as well um, within the city. So we wanna talk next a bit about um, what our approach is um, and our philosophy. So it's multifaceted, but there are a few pieces that we specifically want to highlight. One is that we wanna focus on real authentic systems change so not check boxes, not optics, um, but that it is everyone's responsibility to make systems change. Um, at the same time, we acknowledge very deeply that change happens at the pace of trust. So this process will take time, um, more time than we would like, um, but we know that it will take time. And, and part of our approach is to go slow in order to go fast. Um, another piece that we, that I have talked to a lot of different departments about is that racial equity work is not about doing more work, um, but about doing the same work very differently. Um, and it's the way we should have been governing all along, though most, if not all local governments were not governing in that way. But another component that we focus on is, is truly listening to the experts among us. Um, and those experts are often um, communities of color um, and communities who are directly impacted. So we see our role as the internal sort of interrupters and the thought partners with other city departments who are also focused on accountability. Um, and again, to really focus on internal partnerships as well as external partnerships. The last thing I would sort of leave you all with in terms of our philosophy is that um, we expect um, that the Office of Racial Equity will make mistakes. Um, we know that and we ask in advance for your help in preventing those mistakes, but also learning from the mistakes and moving forward um, together. So with that, our, our overall goal is really that we embed racial equity um, in such a way that it will simply become the way we do business in San Jose um, and not something sort of an add-on or something in addition. One thing that we have also found um, as we engage in this work is that there is a more productive way to frame many of the questions that come up. Um, especially if we want long-term change, long change and we want partners in this work. So we highly encourage all of us to sort of stay on the right side of this image you see before you. Um, it's not only what we say out loud, 
but also that little what the little voice in our head often says, right? So we have to retrain that voice to think about things differently um, if we want to make long-term change. Um, and just to emphasize what we mean here, it's really about shifting from blame, right? Sort of who's a racist to causes. What's the deep cause? What's the root cause of these racial inequities? Shifting from intentions, well, what did they mean? What was their attitude to the actual effects and impacts, right? What were the actions? What were the impacts of this? Um, shifting similarly from prejudice to systems. What made them do that? What were their beliefs to, you know, what were the institutions that were ultimately responsible for these impacts we see? And then also um, from grievance to solutions, right? Our goal is really to focus on what are the proactive strategies and solutions the system could implement. And with that, I will pass on to Sabrina. So this is probably where you guys are itching to get to. Um, these are, are the same kinds of questions that the Office of Racial Equity is trying to integrate into city systems, as Stephanie was talking about. Um, so this is really about just creating the, the expectation that you are asking this all the time. Um, because the answers to these questions, they're not easy to get to. Um, but the questions themselves, if you dig into them, really tend to lead you through a process. So really, the one thing I, we, would, we would always say, if there's just one thing, one piece of this whole this slide that you ask yourselves, it's number one. Who is benefited and who is burdened? You just sort of build that into your thinking from day one and just keep asking it over and over again. Um, and the second piece is really about leveraging data and wondering, you know, sitting down inquisitively to wonder what the data has to present you, especially when you can disaggregate it um, and look at it with through different populations. Um, and then number three actually is sort of an extension of data. It's just a different way of thinking about data. Um, what do community voices and lived experience tell us? So you, you have data as we traditionally think about it, numbers, statistics, trends, um, and that's important. And it can lead you to making some assumptions and um, you, can, you can even think about some solutions, but it's really important that you vet your expectations and really look for depth um, from community because these are the people who are experiencing this. So they are the experts on it and they can tell you where your assumptions may be off or if one solution is better than another. And that is actually very helpful if you are designing a program or um, a, a policy or anything that's meant to help the community because they will tell you ahead of time whether the solution isn't gonna work for them. And then you don't have to come back and try to do it again later when you implement it and realize it isn't working and then wonder why and then just come back to finally redesigning it. So. Number four is really about getting very deep on a question. And one way to, to, to do this is just to ask why five times. Just ask yourself, take one particular aspect of a problem and dig into every single answer you get with a why to really get down deep what systems need to change. It will tell you ultimately sort of what the problem is and, and where things are rubbing up against. And then finally, Number five is really important because accountability is certainly about ensuring that you are giving the information back to the community, but it's also a way of establishing trust, of showing that you have gone, you have asked, you have taken it into consideration, and now you are coming back and explaining what you did with that information. So that when you come back and do this again, because you're supposed to do this all the time, for number three, they're willing to partner with you again and go through it with you again. This is now where we're getting a little bit more specific into our thinking on, on how this racial equity work can apply to your what you're mandated with. Um, and I realize that you may have thought of some of this already, um, but we're really here also to help reinforce some thinking too. Um, so what kind of disaggregated outcome data have you been looking at? What is it telling you? 
Are you looking at voter turnout in different with different cuts, race and district and polling place? Um, is there, do you see institutional racism showing up in any government systems? Um, those are just some suggested initial questions from us. <laughs> and then, and I have to say, I don't know if anyone's hands are up yet, but we will take some questions at the end. I just wanted to address that now. Um, and I'm getting close to the end too. So the second point here is, um, this is really again about that number three on the previous slide, who have you been talking to and how have you been talking to them and when have you been talking to them and in what languages have you been talking to them? Those are important details when it comes to sort of making sure that you are speaking, you're, that you know you're speaking to as broad a, a representational group as possible too. Um, and then what is your plan again for explaining what you did with their input? This is about trust, like I said. So it's also about showing that you valued their time. They didn't just come in and tell you some stuff because they thought it was important and then you didn't bother to come back and more or less say thank you. And then our final slide <clears throat> is some additional suggestions for your work. So this idea of double checking language and terms is something that we keep coming back to as we do the racial equity work ourselves. Whenever you're feeling stuck, it's important to go back to the terms that you're talking about as a group and see if maybe you have some different assumptions underlying those definitions. Um, because sometimes that is what gets you stuck. You're just, you're trying to solve different problems or you think you're talking about the same solution, but you're actually talking about slightly different ones. So that's one general strategy we recommend. Um, also important to, with this through number four here, our understanding is this, you guys have already sort of looked at these three subsets, governance structure, timing of elections, accountability, representation, and inclusion at City Hall. And that's sort of how you're thinking about dividing up the work because that was how it was mandated to you by, I number the first and the second, one of those two, governance and timing, those are fairly well defined. So thinking about accountability, representation, and inclusion, I'd really say that there's a couple of ways you guys could think about approaching this. Um, one would be to have each group look at the charter and bring back sections that you think relate to this when you're thinking about equity. Um, you could have one person take a look and sort of bring it into a small group and have the group discuss based on that person's perspective. You can also broaden this question out beyond the charter and ask the community for their suggestions. Um, I understand that that is something that you guys have been sort of discussing and trying to figure out. So that is a possibility um, and not a bad one. It's okay. We would say it's okay to make broad recommendations without specifics. Um, because it, it can be really daunting if you think you need to come up with specific solutions, but that's, that's what the administration is for. So if you guys feel that there are broad policy recommendations you wanna make um, and council agrees with you, they can just direct staff to come up with solutions and bring them back to council. Um, more specific solutions and bring them back to council. So that was our very quick rundown for you guys. Um, but we are, we're already over time. So with that, are there thank any you. questions? Yeah, thank you both. I'll um, call on some commissioners and uh, I wanna call on Commissioner uh, Marshman first and then Commissioner Train, I'll get back to you. But I uh, uh, also wanna make sure that we hear from as many different commissioners tonight as we can. So Commissioner Marshman. Sorry, I'm, ha I'm having an internet issue here. So if I pop in and out, I apologize. Um, I'm curious, the, the uh, streetlights uh, was a very good example of the kind of difference this can make for, for neighborhoods um, and for different groups. Are there any other examples uh, or any examples in San Jose of changes that have been made or are being made or of issues we can look back on and say, wow, we, we could have done that better. Is, is, there, is there a way to get more specific about what is happening or should be happening? 
So I would start, and Sabrina, feel free to jump in. I would start with, um, I mean, we are early in this, as a city, right? We are very early in this process. I, this is a very small example, but in the context of some of the gear work, one of the things that came out was one of the sort of financial hardship scholarship applications that the city uses um, asked the question, are you a resident of San Jose? Seems like a pretty simple question, but when you translate that into Spanish, that, and Sabrina, I might ask for your help here, but um, the language, when you um, translate that into Spanish, creates a lot of fear around, are you a legal resident, right? For undocumented people, just that sentence um, creates a lot of fear and barriers. And we could, as a city, very simply just ask, do you live in San Jose and avoid that entirely? So if you really look, and if everyone in the city starts thinking that way with that lens, right? Put yourself in someone else's shoes as you read that, then we uncover lots of things. Um, but that's just a very that's concrete example. Very good. Sabrina, did you want to add anything? I mean, there there is another very good example. There's actually a book that's called this. It's called The Curb Cut Effect. And that's the other example was when um, it was disability rights groups that asked to have curb cuts cut in, put in. And yes, obviously the curb cuts when we started doing that as a country was wonderful for people with disabilities, but it turned out that it also helped mothers with strollers, people, delivery guys who had dollies, uh, business people who were, you know, rolling things after themselves, people who were travelers. It ended up having all of these ripple effects that we weren't expecting, but that it really just made life better for all of us. Great, thank you. I'm gonna to go to Commissioner Meitzke. Yes, thank you for your presentation. This is a bit of a detailed question, but I'd like to get your thoughts on, you know, right now, one of the questions we're looking at is if the mayor election should be on um, presidential election years or off presidential election years because you get more people voting on presidential election years. So currently for the district, the council districts, the even ones are on presidential years and the odd ones are not. And I was wondering if we should use an equity lens to kind of look at that question of which districts should have elections on presidential years rather than just going the simple route of odd versus even. Is that something that would make sense um, in terms of looking at the makeup of that particular district and if it if you get a better equity outcome by having more voters on the presidential elections just your thoughts so to your first question of should you apply an equity lens yes <laughs> um but in terms of what that looks like having not done that analysis i am sort of hesitant to provide a sort of specific um response but in general, yes, we would want to look, and some of that starts with looking at data, right, by those different districts, um, which will help inform that. Um, so I hear you, right, like even an odd is somewhat arbitrary, right? So if you really want to apply an equity lens, then starting to unpack that a bit more and ask the same questions that Sabrina talked about, right? Ask, try to come to get to the root cause of that and ask the why questions um, multiple times. Sabrina, do you have to jump off? Anything to add? Okay. Nothing. Great. So uh, in the spirit of just um, continuing to hear from folks we haven't heard from yet, I'm gonna go to Commissioner Amador and then I've got Commissioners Fuentes and Sanchez. Great, thank you. And thank you again for being here and taking this time to go through a pr that presentation. Um, that was really great. But um, I do have a question on, is there a current toolkit right now that the Racial Equity Office has adopted or that is using or that is uh, implementing in other departments? I know that um, it's fairly new, this department, and that you guys are talking about it with different other departments within the city. But is there um, a toolkit yet and possibly that we could even adopt here um, to really look at the impacts and the burdens that any decisions that we make or that we start analyzing? moving forward might support through looking through that lens of equity, racial equity? Well, we we certainly have sort of, we've came, we came up with um, a couple of worksheets that we've used for the budgeting process, which we could share with you guys. Um, and we have a resource, an internal departmental, like an intranet 
um, resource list for staff who are interested with a variety of things in it. And um, I was commenting to Stephanie as we were putting together this presentation that I was really frustrated when I first started, um, even pre gear So it was the year before 2018 when Sulma and Stephanie were going through the learning year um, because I wanted an answer. I got in and they, you know, at, we were asking questions. What do you have? What can we use? And they kept coming back with like, here are the questions. And we were, and I was like, what? But now that I've been doing this work for a few years, now I understand that the questions that I shared on the A slide, that really is the toolkit. Um, it, the problem is it doesn't, it doesn't give you like an easy answer because you have to go out and find the data. You have to go out and find the communities. You have to make sure you guys are defining the questions clearly for yourselves so that you know what you're all solving for together um, and what the parameters are. So it's a really messy thing, which is why it's hard to really give something more concrete than that. But what we do have, we would be happy to share. Anything to add, Stephanie? I would say, um, I believe someone um, in the commission shared the GARE toolkit as well. Um, I mean, that is, it's a lot longer, but it is basic. I think there's six steps we left out, sort of the solutions one, but um, in our slide, um, I mean, those really, that is the process, right? And it's, as Sabrina said, it is, it is actually a process, right? It's not a just sort of spit something out, right? There's a lot of iteration. There's a lot of checking back in with community and understanding, did I understand this correctly? And how should I explore this more deeply? Might not be the answer you wanted, <laughs> but I think it's the answer that we have come to from sort of trying to unpack a lot of these issues. And it's also what we're trying to, um, to move the city towards, right? If every person in the city asked all of those questions as they're making decisions, um, it would be a different result. Um, Thank you. So uh, continuing the spirit of making sure that we hear from folks we haven't heard from yet tonight, I'm going to go with um, Commissioner Barrosio, and then I want to uh, get to Commissioner Fuentes, and then we're going to need to wrap up and move on. Uh, a few of you have already shared questions with me for the Detroit Charter Commissioners. I would encourage you to do the same for Stephanie and Sabrina, and uh, I don't think this is the last time we'll be hearing from them if they will uh, continue to, to liaise with us. So um, Commissioner Barrosio. Perfect, thank you. Um, and thank you to our guest speakers. Um, this is very valuable. Uh, the question that I have is, um, obviously you've talked to a lot of our departments here in the city and um, you've compiled, um, I imagine a lot of data, right? Both, both at, the, um, at the department level, uh, city level and with um, key stakeholders. So my question is, have you seen any common threads, anything that that you see that um, impacts all the districts or anything um, um, at, the, at the department level where you see uh, like just some hot topics, right? We just heard from Detroit. Um, they've had some, some like run-ins with, with, the, with the fallout of the bankruptcy, um, uh, like water affordability. So like something district, um, uh, specific, but also citywide. So I wonder if there's any hot topics that you've seen both at the citywide level um, and also anything that you've seen that is also probably um, outliers um, in terms of the districts. Are there any district patterns that you see that creates um, a San Jose that we can improve, right? The have districts and the have not districts. Is there anything that you can tell us, any patterns, any data that you can um, point us to? Uh, that would be greatly appreciated. I'll, you want me to jump in, Sabrina? Sure. <laughs> um, I mean, I feel a little bit like a broken record, but in terms of common threads, it is, as a city, right, it is these foundational pieces of, do we have data disaggregated by race that we can even look at, um, or, or a proxy for race? Um, similarly, around community engagement, that is a common question um, ask, right, from departments is, that sounds good, community engagement, but how do I really do that? And how do I, um, how do I allocate resources, including staff time and, and staff sort of expertise on how to do that well? Um, I mean, the city has a history of doing 
the way they do public engagement, but it doesn't necessarily mean it has resulted in hearing from people who have been most negatively and or directly impacted by the city's processes. So um, those are two of the things that I would lift up. Um, and I, I, I don't know that that's the answer you're looking for, um, but from each department, it's just so very different, right? Well, I, I, here, I guess here's another one. Um, it would be hiring, right? How do we really hire, recruit, promote um, communities of color who can represent um, and can see, even in their own work, sort of see the world through a different lens? Um, that's another piece that, of that puzzle. It's, All right. Oh, I mean, ahead. part of. Oh, sorry. Part of what I would say to that to answer that question too would be that Stephanie started to sort of touch on it. There is a really big difference from department to department, and even within departments, of who even has data right now. So part of what the job has been right now has just been trying to get staff to understand why they need data so that they can develop systems to start gathering it. So we do see little pockets of data here and there, but that, that's not fair. We see there's a lot of data, but there's a lot of data that we are also not experts in understanding. And so we have to rely on the departments to tell us like, this is useful data, this is not useful data. And of that data, there are some things that we've seen, but it's, it's, it's too soon, I think, to make any determinations broadly about pockets, other than to say that what you sort of expect when you look at low-income communities, those tend to be the ones that are struggling the most. And that means you know, low-income zip codes. It also means homeless people. You know, so people who are struggling are the ones who are struggling. And, that is, and if there's concentrations of that in the city, that's where you're seeing it. It's not, it's following that basic trend. It's not very different than that. I'm gonna- um... Yeah, I'm gonna wrap this up, uh, Chair. So um, I just wanna thank, uh, I'm sorry, we need to move on. We have public comment. We have a big discussion. So again, I would ask that uh, commissioners, if you have additional questions, please send them to me. I will facilitate sharing them with Stephanie and Sabrina. I deeply apologize, but uh, you know, I would really did want a privilege making sure we heard from folks that we hadn't heard from yet tonight, which is one of my kind of uh, tactics as a facilitator to make sure that all voices are lifted up. Um, so uh, apologies. Uh, we have a, a big schedule tonight. Thank you, uh, Stephanie and Sabrina, for, for joining us. Uh, we gave you a little extra time because this is important work and really appreciate what you're doing at the city. Uh, appreciate you sharing the framework with us and uh, asking, asking us to keep asking the tough questions. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, open public comment on the two guests' uh, study session. So will the clerk call the first guest? First speaker? I'm the speaker 5140. Let's see, Detroit, you know, unfortunately it became, has become a failed city. Uh, it was a wonderful city once upon a time. It was the envy of the United States. And now look at it. And these are the people who are going to, you're going to take guidance from. I find it a bit strange. I also find it a bit strange that the city wants all these nice things for people and equality and equity, but you know, get a traffic citation or a parking ticket or, you know, a minor misdemeanor from uh, San Jose, po I mean, San Jose Police Department and see what happens. Do you think that if you want equity and equality, do you think giving out citations that cost thousands of dollars creates good public, you know, good, does it create goodwill? No, it doesn't. And do you think just because you hire some minority people, that this is going to make it better when you get a code citation for having a shed in your backyard or a flagpole that's too high or you're driving over potholes. I mean, you guys need to do a lot more things before you can even move on to equity because you run a fascistic city at the moment anyway. So all you're doing is, is uh, using this sort of vocabulary to make it look good while you're arresting minority people taking away their guns taking away their marijuana 
I mean, guns and marijuana are, are legal from what I understand. Second Amendment and the way you've got the ordinance are passed, marijuana is legal. But somebody of color has it, man. You guys broadcast it on Twitter with pictures and everything and who their names are. You guys should be ashamed of yourselves down there. You're not doing anything good, good for this town. I'm driving over potholes. You know, uh, my, uh, my Vietnam veteran neighbor had to take his flagpole down because it was an inch too high because of code enforcement. You guys are trying to put a rainbow flag on o- o- over a swastika. I'm telling you, you guys need to uh, decriminalize driving, decriminalize smoking cigarettes, decriminalize open container alcohol, decriminalize uh, these re- these ridiculous parking tickets. Next speaker, please. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, I was a little late to the meeting tonight. Uh, the city of Oakland is working on their issues of uh, equity and reimagine uh, and defund for their community future. It's really interesting work. And so I was a little late. I, I sent you guys a letter last week to Tony Tabor. I hope she mailed it, sent it to everyone that, uh, or at least to the chair and hopefully to everyone, that um, it's my hope that the public meeting process here has a bit more uh, public forum to it. Uh, You could easily in consent calendar and meeting minutes, the uh, the previous meeting minutes, that can easily be a place that also has letters from the public usually, that can easily be a place to have a, a, a maybe a one minute public forum where people can, you know, address, uh, you know, issues of previous meetings and, and, and general topics before the start of you going into items, because that can give a uh, kind of a, a, a tone for how you can address your items that you've been working on all along for the past few weeks, and that everyday public may, has not had that privilege to be a part of. And it, it sets a good tone, I think, for how to what to expect for for the for the remainder of a meeting and uh, how you can work and and to have public comment immediately after uh, uh, you have guest speakers instead of going to your own panel first and be on your our own commission. That also is an important concept of the public meeting process that you're not respecting. And that I understand, you know, the study process is a respectable way to work and it creates a studying feeling. But I think you need comment from the public first. That way, even the speakers, the guest speakers can hear ideas and concepts. And uh, that's, that's it's important stuff and it's subtle, but it's good to work on. Thank you. Roland. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Uh, good, good, e- good evening, uh, Commissioners. Thank you for your service. Sometimes I think you, you deserve uh, danger, danger money for serving. Uh, but g- going back to the prior speaker, I, I think a good compromise what many cities do. You get a present staff presentation, then you go to uh, committee questions, then you hear uh, from the, the public, and then you close off with, with final comments. And if somebody could mute themselves, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, moving on to tonight's business, uh, I personally did not really, uh, Toby, I'm not seeing my clock. I, I did not really um, uh, connect with the uh, presentation by the uh, Detroit uh, uh, commissioners, except the closing comment, which says that they spend more time of, with members of the public during subcommittee meetings. And, and here, okay, now I see my clock. And um, here, uh, what's happening is that you have those ad hoc committees, which are not open to the public, so it's completely the opposite. Uh, with regards to issue of equity, it was unclear to me why you should be going out to the um, City of San Jose Office of Racial Equity instead of going out to the Detroit commissioners and, and reach out to them on, on racial equity and, and use you know, their input to inform the City of San Jose Office of Racial Equity. I hope what I said just said makes sense, but to me that seemed a little bit backwards. I'm going to give you an example. Right now I'm on Zoom. Thank you, City of San Jose. I'm looking at closed captioning, but in the capital of Silicon Valley, there should be a way to enable closed captioning in multiple languages, not just English. Thank you. 
Robert yeah. Brownstein. Good evening. Uh, I think most members of the commission um, share the view that you would like your proposals to increase the level of racial equity in the city and certainly not um, increase the level of racial inequity in the city. The question is, how do you achieve those goals? Well, one thing that would be helpful, as was mentioned by the um, city staff working on this issue, is to have some standard questions that are asked of every single proposal. Does it increase the representation of low-income people of color? Does it increase accountability for low-income people of color? Does it increase the likelihood that low-income people of color will get a fair share of city services and, and city programs? Uh, but even if you have those questions, you have to answer those questions. And that's not going to be easy to do, especially since we don't know what all the policy proposals will be that will occur in the city during the next two years, four years, 10 years, et cetera. But one thing that we could do is look at some of the things that happened in the past, uh, particularly the ones that were counter to racial equity, things like the way that redevelopment happened in San Jose, gentrification in San Jose, the fact that San Jose is the weakest rent control law in the Bay Area, the fact that San Jose is the weakest police oversight program in the Bay Area. Look at those things and ask whether the proposals that you're considering would have helped avoid those and would have helped turn out a better outcome from the perspective of racial equity. And those, those kinds of answers might prove to be um, ones where you can really have some information and data to work with rather than trying to look into the future and the future is hard to behold. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. That was the final speaker. Thank you. Let us now move to um, our next item in terms of old business is um, Tony is going to give us an update on the budget implications of what uh, action the council took. Um, and we have direction specifically from uh, council on a discussion that we need to have. And that's why I'm limiting our conversation and keeping us moving through because we have a very important discussion to, to move through with um, our city clerk. So Tony, you want to take over and uh, talk us through the budget issue and then begin the conversation about um, the outside council um, direction from, from council. Yes, I need to keep my video off. I apologize because of I've got three kids in, in evening classes right now. So I, I fear that I'll lose all of you if I try to upload video. Um, but the budget was approved and what was approved was for, for interpretation and translations. Um, I've already made arrangements for interpreta interpretations for next your next meeting. When it comes to translations, it's a lot of documents. So um, I met with Lawrence and with Fred, the chair, last week. We're going to start translating some of the, the key documents first. You know, the work plan, the, the 101, um, that like the ch Charter 101, we're going to start with key documents um, to try to get us up to speed and get as many things translated as possible, but also concentrating on the ones that have the most impact. Um, translating minutes, probably not as impactful right now as um, like the minutes from the early, early meetings versus the presentations that you've received. So um, that's like the, the two big things. They did not approve outside counsel. And the main reason it sounds like in their discussion for not approving outside counsel was not- Before we get there, right. they did approve the additional research and the additional- Oh, yes. Yeah. Approved the additional research um, that will, and community outreach. So we'll be working with Lawrence on his scope for um, civic makers to expand their scope to include that. So if I could just clarify that before I go further, okay. um, expand our scope to contract with the outside community organizations to reach the populations that are most important um, to this, uh, this body. Uh, also to work with those organizations to help us develop the materials that we want to translate 
to make sure that what we're putting out is being framed in a way that those communities can understand. So basically, one of our next steps is going to be working on a, um, a draft community engagement plan um, that would leverage the, um, the advice, help, uh, consultation, and outreach services of, of local organizations. So there's more to come on that. Uh, there's been a lot of input from you all. I'm going to try and reflect that as best we can. Um, but I just wanted to, to do a quick interjection on, on that front. Um, and I'll turn it back to, to Tony about the, the outside council. All right, so the outside council is the part that um, nobody quite understood. I'm gonna actually try, I'm very uncomfortable not having the video on. So we're gonna give it a shot. It's it's almost distracting to just speak into nothing. That feels so. Um, they were partially supportive of outside council, but they couldn't figure out why you needed outside council. So that they instructed me to come back and talk to you. And what I would like to do is to hear you guys articulate why outside counsel is important to you. And then I wanna read that back because I think we had a lot of generalized conversation about it, but nothing that we could really just like concretely say, this is why they want out, why outside counsel is needed. You know, they looked at whether or not it's a conflict of interest and they said it's not a, um, the feeling is the city attorney does not have a conflict of interest in this particular um, discussion or in the charter review. Um, they asked about the historical reason for why the 1985 had outside counsel and, you know, the current city attorney was not present in 1985. She did say that the litigators were, were even outside counsel back then. So it could have been just a staffing structure issue, but there was, there's no reason really given for why they had outside council in 1985 because nobody was was around to understand that justification. So I would like you guys to start telling me what you would like me to tell the council of why you think outside council is important. And I, I would add to the frame of saying really what specific needs do you think the city attorney's office cannot fulfill to assist preparing the recommendations? So we, we really have to be clear to make this case. So not so much why would we use outside counsel, lots of reasons for that, but really it's what specific needs do you think city attorney's office cannot fulfill to assist us in preparing our recommendations? Uh, I see Commissioner Fuentes. Yeah, that sounds okay. Um, you know, um, I really appreciated the um, the present the both uh, presentations tonight. I think they really help us to kind of have a framework of our work. And um, looking at the question about outside counsel from an equity lens, is that if you look at where we are today, I mean, I think. Um, Bob Brownstein presented very good questions as to how we can look at, at the questions before us. I mean, he was talking specifically about recommendations um, that we're gonna be looking at, but we can look at everything that we do through the same kind of questions in that equity lens. And so if we think in our city of you know, and Bob Brownstein named several, you know, issues where there is inequity in our city. So we are actually, you know, needing to disrupt some of that if we're gonna be focusing on equity. And so I would say an independent council is one way to help us separate from lack of a better word, the status quo, the, the internal ongoing process and procedures that are always kind of accepted and give us more independence and so that we can do some of this equity work. Thank you. Other thoughts from commissioners? Uh, uh, Commissioner Siegel and Commissioner Matsumura. I just wanted to echo, there was a caller who when this question came up and it may be the I don't, I don't remember the caller's name, but he, um, he used to work for the city and he said that when this goes to vote, it's going to cost 
30, 35 million dollars anyway. So if right now at the onset we can really uh, accurately figure out how we are going to put this before uh, the, the citizens of San Jose that, that we'll save ourselves a lot of money um, and time in the end because lots and lots of outside attorneys are going to be picking this thing apart. Millions of dollars are going to be thrown at this election. And so it doesn't make any sense to let um, uh, attorney Vanini just, uh, I'm sorry, Mark Vanni to be the, you know, the, the, all of it to be on his shoulders when he actually is representing a lot of other issues for this city. Um, that in fact, it would really help the the city attorney's office as well as the citizens of San Jose to have um, an independent attorney on our side. I'm not saying this is my position. I'm just reiterating what I thought was good reasoning by someone who commented. Thanks. Um, Commissioner Matsumura. Uh, we can't hear you. Thank you. I think it was very helpful to hear about this from Mr. Satchel in, in Detroit. Um, you know, and I, I think he spoke to sort of an intrinsic awkwardness at best, right? That what, what he said is that it is the job of the city attorney's office to work for the city of San Jose, and it is the job of the elected officials, the mayor and city council, to define what that means. Ultimately, they are the leaders defining what are, what's in the best interest of the city of San Jose. And so it it's certainly puts the city council and the city attorney in an awkward position to be the ones to say, yes, it's appropriate for the commission to, to have outside counsel. Um, and yet it sounds like in Detroit, there's been a, a general person's agreement. And so, you know, the question would be, why, why don't the mayor and, and council want us to have outside counsel? Just recognizing that there is that inherent challenge, you know, and if I, I think about it personally, would I want my own attorney to be hired by someone else and to report to someone else? Bottom line, we need, this is a complex legal issue and we need legal counsel uh, working, uh, as Mr. Satchel said, in close collaboration and complementarily to uh, the office of the city attorney, um, but to be working with us. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I think one of the challenges is what I did here in, in the city council debate is it seems that there was some openness to this, this issue if a conflict of interest were to arise. But the problem is unless we encumber the money now and begin an RFP process now, all, all of that could take months. If we wait until a conflict of interest arises, it could take literally three to four months to get funding and do an RFP process. We need to have those resources lined up already, and we need to, to establish a way that we could make a determination of what the scope is necessary for outside counsel and, and where we're gonna determine that that's, that's the support that's needed and have a clear delineation of roles between outside counsel versus the, the support that we've been receiving and look forward to continuing to receive from Mr. Vani and the Office of the City Attorney. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bruce. Thank you. I think a lot of a lot of my sentiments really align with what Commissioner Matsumura shared. I think, you know, Mr. Satchel shared, you know, very eloquently about independence um, from city attorney, from the mayor and council and having that true um, independence in, you know, um, you know, when the city attorney and mayor and council decide what is, you know, what is deemed, um, you know, independent or a conflict of interest. And I think, you know, just around, you know, li uh, lining up and procuring um, the funding now. So in case we ever do down the road, find ourselves, we're in a position where the city attorney's office is in a uh, conflict of interest that we're not going to take four or five months to, to put, you know, to put out the RFP to bid that we have it lined up and we can fill that gap. Thanks. 
Um, additional thoughts from commissioners about this question? Uh, Commissioner Callender. Uh, yeah, no, I, I just see that Mr. Brownstein had raised his hand and I know that when he had the opportunity to present in front of us, <clears throat> he had some very strong thoughts and recommendations on why we should be going from outside counsel. So if the, if the please of the chair, I would like to ask for Mr. Brownstein to speak. Uh, you're muted, Fred. Not going to go back out to the public. I'm going to. Uh, we have a few other commissioners that want to speak, so let's hear from the commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Sanchez, and then uh, Diep. Yeah, uh, my understanding, and I'm not. I'm, you know, I. I mean, I'm not uh, an expert on all the, the law that's uh, that's practiced there in city city hall. But my understanding is that they're hired, uh, in a, for certain areas of expertise. <laughs> And so, uh, and so we're bringing them in to help us. And it may not be uh, their area of expertise. It may, it may not. We may not get the best advice from them uh, on top of all the other jobs they're doing. So I, I for one, really feel that we need uh, to seek uh, our own counsel as we move forward. Especially, especially if they want us to do the, the best job possible. That's the bottom line. Now if they don't. Then I guess we're stuck with the, with the attorneys there. I'm not saying they're not. They're not good attorneys, but I think, I think uh, moving forward, we really do, uh, we really would benefit from having our own uh, legal counsel to to this commission. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Diep. Yeah, I, I just want to raise for the uh, commission's consideration that um, when we talk about like conflict of interest, it, it's about you know parties, groups being in adverse you know conflict with each other, uh, some sort of argument, and we're in the context of San Jose, different than the city of Detroit, I was listening to our previous speaker, um, you know, the, they have independent counsel because they're running a campaign to go directly to the voters to, to change the charter. Um, and it, it is a check on the mayor. Uh, whereas in San Jose, our process goes back ultimately to the council. Anyway, we're making a recommendation and the council can accept everything. They can amend a recommendation. They can uh, not take anything we recommend. So we're essentially writing a, a research paper to the best of our ability to form the best uh, recommendations we can. And in, in that context, I don't know that there would ever be a, a conflict, um, you know, uh, different than the Detroit mayor. Uh, our mayor can't hire, fire, and do the things that we're discussing right now. Uh, so there's no, there's no, at least for now, there's no need for a check, I don't think. So I just offer that in, in light of what we heard from Detroit. Thank you. I see Commissioner Lazat has her hand raised. Yeah, I was going to say something similar to Council Member Diep. Um, you know, the Detroit model is completely different from what we're doing. In Detroit, there are elected officials and they are uh, able to hire and fire their own staff. We're an advisory body to the council. That's all we are. And as Ms. Diep said, you know, we're going to give that to the council our best um, shot at what they're asking us to, to look at, and they can either take it or not. Uh, with regard to the, to the council, um, you know, he's, he's assigned to us to help us. I don't understand the adversary position that's being taken with regard to our council. Um, he's going to be helping us uh, with our duties and to help write whatever it is that we wanna bring to the council. We're going to have the opportunity to review what he's going to write uh, before it ever goes to the council. So it's it's. I just don't understand the the, the issue at all. Uh, there is no conflict of interest. Although the council did say, you know, unless there's a um, a palatable conflict of interest or some other concern, you know, that they were going to stay with the city council. But if another if if a conflict of interest, I don't know how it would possibly happen or some other concern came up, then they might um, look at the issue again. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think we can really compare what we're doing uh, with um, the, the city of Detroit and uh, their, their absolute necessity for outside counsel. I would have supported outside counsel if I was on their commission. We're totally different. Uh, we're advisory to the council only. Thank you. Um... Additional thoughts? Uh, 
anything that you would like council to hear from this commission about general counsel. Vice Chair Johnson. Oh, thank you, Lawrence. Um, I think because we are an advisory council that it is important even more so to remove undue influences. And I think that's why some of their commissioners are um, you know, asking for a general counsel. And I think the optics of this is also important too, especially if we're gonna look into engaging the public more in this process. And those are my two cents. Great, thank you. Uh, last call. Um, again, um, city clerk is asking for you to help clarify the request from this commission uh, for additional funding for general counsel. So this is your this is your moment to 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 help bolster the argument. And if we don't have any more, Tony, do you want to re uh, report uh, back what you heard? Let me read back. Um, it obviously needs to be wordsmithed. I was writing as fast as I can. Um, one, Maria said that independent counsel will separate the CRC from the in internal status quo to do work towards equity. I have from Magnolia, um, because when this goes to vote, it will cost a significant amount of money. Um, it would be good to have outside counsel ahead of time because it, the outside council, other outside councils are gonna pick apart the, the commission, the, not the commission, the measure. So it'd be good to have an outside perspective ahead of time. I, and then from Ellie, I have that it's good to get ahead of it, ahead of any potential conflict of interest, encumber now, do an RFP now. So if a conflict does come up, we're ready to go. Um, and she also said that um, it's the job of the city attorney's office to work with the city of San Jose, so it puts the city in an awkward position um, and that you need legal counsel to work for us. Jeremy um, echoed the getting ahead of any conflict of interest um, and doing encumbering and doing an RFP early. Um, George Sanchez said that um, city attorneys are hired for certain areas of expertise so we may not have an, a currently staffed in, attorney that for whom this is their area of expertise, whereas we could get that from outside counsel. And then I wrote down the comments from um, Lundia Linda, and Linda. Um, do you, I don't know if you want me to repeat those back because they were um, not supporting outside counsel. Um, but Lund said that ultimately, and Lund and Linda both said ultimately, counsel's making the decision. So we don't need to have an attorney um, to sort of craft your own independent ballot measure. And then um, Christina said to that uh, outside counsel will reduce undue influences and provides better optics. Did that sound, does that sound good? Okay. Um, Christopher is up. Yeah, Christopher is up. Yeah, I mean, I, Tony, um, I wish you would watch the recording because I think it's important that uh, council member Dieps and my uh, counter arguments uh, be heard by the council as well. Yeah, I, I will include those. And I don't, I don't think you've captured them all. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'm gonna ask then that we talk about our subcommittee process, and then we're going to be moving towards uh, public uh, comments on this as well. So. Uh, Lawrence, let's walk us through the subcommittee structure and a list of recommendations. Sure. And uh, I want to acknowledge that um, the, oop, oh, sorry, that's the wrong screen, um, that the memo that came in from commissioners, um, Calendar Matsumura and Vice Chair Johnson today, uh, I have not had a chance to really process that. Gosh, I keep sharing the wrong, wrong screen. Uh, process that or um, uh, reflect the uh, the recommendations in what I'm going to share with you right now, but um, I will just uh, go ahead and share. Um, and where are we? Apologies here. Okay, so uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what I, I continued to add to this based on some of the conversation uh, during our last meeting. Um, the input we received from you all about the interest in various subcommittees. Um, and the um, um, conversations I had with um, 
the chair and um, city staff. Uh, what you know, what I did was I basically looked at um, the uh, how do we break out these three buckets into more specific topics. Um, to do that, we looked at the um, the list of possible recommendations. This was, as I've mentioned, something that I've been trying to keep um, as new ideas come up, um, both from you all and from guest speakers, just a, a running list here um, of at least conversation starting points that can be looked at into uh, further in subcommittees, as well as um, proposals that came up last summer um, and were cited in mayor and council memos. So this is a living document. Uh, again, the idea here is to just track the conversation and seed the work of the subcommittees with, with this list. I won't go into it. Um, there will be many more to add here, but uh, this is just uh, a way to um, jumpstart the conversation. Um, so I also added um, that I don't think that we have the, the right uh, list of subcommittees yet. And I think the what was shared in the, the memo gets into more detail. I also, you know, I think that we, as far as this third bucket, there's been some interest from um, commissioners to do a public hearing to help understand what could be comprised under this bucket. Now that we have additional funding for community engagement uh, and we can map out what a first public hearing could look like, you know, I do want to, to ask commissioners to give us um, on the logistics side a little time to think about what the calendar will look like and how that might inform um, what we hear from the public and how that might inform the, the final subcommittee structures and, and the specific topics. Uh, I agree we're not there yet. Uh, I did want to try and bring just a little bit more definition to how the subcommittees could operate. This is a, a step in the right direction. Hopefully it reflects some of the intent about the memo that was shared. but. Really, we want to get a lead um, for each subcommittee, uh, a couple other roles, including note taker, um, researcher, researchers. Um, we are hoping to uh, at least have someone uh, on the support side facilitate uh, the first couple meetings for subcommittees so that we can build capacity and get things up and running um, in an effective way. Um, right now, after conversation with the city attorney, we are recommending um, that commissioners only join one subcommittee and not attend other subcommittees to avoid a serial meeting uh, conflict of the Brown Act. Uh, I see in the memo that there was a request that we figure out ways. We're talking to the city attorney. If we can come up with anything, we will. Right now, we're operating on the, on the side of caution on that regard. Um, that will also influence how subcommittees can talk to each other um, so that, uh, you know, again, we're, we're, we're staying within the bounds of the, of the Brown Act. Uh, I've got a proposed kind of meeting process here, uh, a rough agenda. This is all up for debate, but you know, I really, again, to build the capacity of committees to be moving as quickly as possible, I wanted to, to put some forth some ideas to, to how the subcommittees will actually operate. Um, and also the communication rules. Um, really, we are asking you all to, to use your at least CC or official, official commission email addresses for all communications. And thank you all for as you continue to start to do that. Uh, I really appreciate the emails that have been coming in to me from your official commission emails. Um, right now, again, because of the Brown Act violations and serial meetings, we're asking the email threads for subcommittees only include commissioners assigned to that specific subcommittee. We don't have the assignments yet, but we're, again, we're putting the essentially the bylaws into place here. Um, and subcommittees must avoid communicating with each other to avoid a serial meeting violation of the Brown Act. The idea here is that we're going to need to have some way during commission meetings to share communication between subcommittees and the chair and I and, and, and city clerk and the secretary are talking and the city attorney are talking through ways to do that. There's been some um, uh, requests for specific, specific topics or additional research, and I think some uncertainty about really how this whole subcommittee process is going to work from commissioners. Um, really, the idea is that after we finish up the study phase um, and we set up the, the subcommittee uh, membership and the list of topics, and we have kickoff meetings, um, that you all go do your work um, to investigate research, do a deep analysis of potential topics for consideration, and that you use the template that we provided that will inevitably have um, some additions and, and revisions for uh, basically a, a, a recommendation memo. And this is what we heard from the uh, um, 
the representatives from the Detroit Charter Commission, which I'm, I'm glad to hear they use a similar process. I think it should be fairly um, effective and I want to reflect some of the things we've heard to add to that. Um, but that's again, a starting point. But the, I think the goal of the commission, uh, the subcommittees is gonna to be to do the work of taking these germ a seed of an idea and, and putting into that, doing the work to get it into that memo of a potential recommendation to bring back for discussion but for the full committee. Uh, we do recognize that we're gonna to need to move around the work plan to facilitate enough time for subcommittees to, to do that work, um, especially um, you know, given the breadth of some of these, these topics. So we will be working on that. Again, now that there's additional um, funding for community engagement, we'll be before our next meeting reworking the the um, the work plan timeline to uh, think about uh, a public hearing and um, how we might uh, structure the timeline for to enable to work of the subcommittees and also um, um, calendar out the specific discussions or the recommendations that are brought back from subcommittees. Uh, but really, you know, my hope is that each subcommittee can provide brief, regular written reports for the full subcommission or for the full commission, with something like the following information: uh, information, um, uh, current list of topics under consideration. Sorry, that's a typo there. Um, any questions a subcommittee would like to bring back to the group, um, and then a list of attached draft recommendation memos for commission. So. Um, again, to address the need for, for the full commission, but also subcommittees to be able to understand what's happening um, in other subcommittees. Um, we want to create some kind of flow information from subcommittees to the full commission back to subcommittees, but again, need to be aware of potential serial meeting violations of the Brown Act. We'll do our best to scope that out. The city attorney, is, uh, Mark, has, has been very helpful in that regard. Um, and then again, we have the recommendations process, which um, uh, marks out at a high level what was included in the template that I shared last time. Um, and, um, you know, I think we heard some great recommendations tonight to improve this even further. Uh, the last thing I'll share is just that um, um, we did a little bit of rearrangement of the, um, the uh, work plan here. Actually, I realized that um, <laughs> I have a note for myself um, to move up election timing. Um, and I didn't do that before I sent this out. Although this is yeah, this is the one that was sent out. Um, so uh, the the recommendation on the, um, the commissioner memo about moving up election timing, we agree. That was my intention, actually, to, to put this at the top here and have more time for both governance structure and additional measures subcommittees to do their work. Um, this is a dynamic process. We're doing our best to figure it out. And like I said, I think with the um, kind of scoping out what the community engagement looks like, um, coming back to you all uh, on the 17th with a, a I really, I think a more final proposal of what the, the next phase of work, both for community engagement and um, uh, recommendation discussion could look like. I think we're ready for that. And you know, we, we, uh, the last thing I'll say is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, that the, the additional funds, um, the, the quickest way that the city clerk could figure out uh, how to use those funds once they were approved by the council was to expand the scope of civic makers to, uh, contract with um, additional uh, partners to do both the research as well as the um, uh, community engagement and outreach. So uh, it's my intention to put together some thoughts what specifically that could look like, start talking to organizations uh, this week and really get that going as soon as possible, especially around um, understanding what the core materials are that we need to translate and start to uh, how we frame the messaging based on the input from the community partners so that we are um, talking about uh, this conversation in a language um, that is understood by the communities we wanna listen to uh, and that we know we understand it by uh, representatives of the communities helping us um, doing that message for itself. So uh, I'm excited about it. I, I congratulate you all on, on making that um, uh, that argument and and, um, and the chair for, for making sure that it was passed. And uh, I will do my best to, to honor you know your your uh, interest in that community engagement. Um, and so please be patient with me and with us as we figure that out. Um, and I think I'll just stop there unless there was anything else that the chair wanted me to to share. No, that's it. I see four hands from commissioners and Mr. Callender had his hand up. I don't know if it's still up, but um, Commissioner Siegel, why don't we start with you? Thank you so much. Uh, I'm a little unsure about um, the subcommittees spending so much time on topics that the majority will not be listening to. And then the majority will just be getting 
our overview of recommendations, but won't have had the time to really understand uh, why we reached those recommendations and all the data we may have heard or the speakers we may have invited. And so um, my question is, will the majority be voting on whether the recommendations the subcommittees make actually make it to the council members or is that just an issue for the subcommittees? That is, let's say a subcommittee it sounds like you know the answer already. I'll let you speak. Yeah, I mean, the, the intention here, and I think we heard it from the folks from Detroit, is that the subcommittees are tasked with really um, uh, vetting these ideas, doing the hard work of researching it, and bringing it back to the full commission for discussion and decision about whether it should be put forth into a final recommendation um, or, or not. Uh, inevitably, I think that there probably will be uh, at least some conversation about consensus, if not voting on specific things. Um, but the idea here is that um, the, the subcommittees do the work to make sure that this commission has a productive conversation about a topic that has been fully thought out as much as possible by the, the subcommittees themselves. The, the, the practical, the let me, how do I phrase this? The, the, the reality of the situation is that we have to, you uh, have to deliver recommendations by mid-December. I need to facilitate that process for you. And if we were to have full discussions of every topic by the full commission, we would never get there. So we really did need to do enable um, you all to do the work um, you know, in, in your time outside of these meetings, which is so much. And, you know, I really appreciate the continued um, commitment from you all to do that. But that's going to need to happen to make sure that all the topics that you want to talk about are really thought about in the, the depth and uh, intention and um, nuance that they will require, um, and then can enable a, a conversation by the full committee. So um, I hope that answers your question. Um, and I, um, the kind of, yeah, was there a comment, Chair? Um, Vice Chair Johnson. Vice Chair Johnson, go ahead. Yep. Um, I had multiple questions. One is um, I noticed in this plan there isn't a talk about how the public can communicate with us. I think the Detroit commissioners brought it up how important it is for the public to be engaged in the subcommittee process. Um, two, I want more of a defined timeline on how the community engagement plan looks like, and I want to be involved in that process. Um, as vice chair. Um, and then three, I can, oh, can we have a motion? Can I have a motion to add discussions of other memos um, to all future agendas? Because, you know, I, I feel like we want to comment on this process and we weren't really included in this. Um, so a couple things I would say is um, the community engagement plan will include the timeline. The timeline will then help us to understand when does the public hearings happen? Since we need to have the public engaged with our community partners in order to have that first public hearing. So next uh, meeting, the consultants will bring back our plan to be like, okay, here's the plan, here's the timeline, and here's where the public hearings fit in. Now that we know how much time it's gonna take to engage and contract with our community partners. So I would say Vice Chair Johnson that that is the, now that we have the approval, we've got to increase the scope of work and have the consultants work on the plan, which includes the timeline. Um, yeah, and we've 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 waited to to continue to build out a community engagement timeline until we had direction from council. So we're there. Um, I can commit to getting you something to review by the end of. Uh, next Friday, as we talked about, as far as our communications cadence, so that you all have the weekend to review and we can have a deeper discussion about that next next Monday. Um, if you have additional uh, ideas, uh, um, in addition to the memo that we shared, again, I didn't have a chance to really review that memo um, since it was shared today. Um, so uh, I would appreciate direct emails or anything that you would like to see reflected. I'll do my best to incorporate it. Um, and again, your patience because we're just trying our best, uh, you know, on a tight turnaround here. Uh, and I, I, I hope that I can just um, offer you my, uh, I hope I've, I've developed um, uh, some good faith uh, from you all that I'm trying to honor your efforts and, and, and not try and um, behind the scenes change things and, and, um, and cut anything short. You know, again, I'm, I'm really doing my best here. So uh, Vice Chair, even if you feel open to a separate conversation or something, I'd be happy to chat. And um, the other question you had, Vice Chair Johnson, was about public input into the subcommittee process. 
And I'm gonna take that, I took note of that tonight and I'm gonna take that to the city attorney to make sure that we are clear about what the rules would be about that if we can do that. What we're, what we're challenged by is hub and spoke rules, not just serial meeting, but hub and spoke. So we'll definitely have to answer that question and have uh, legal give us some, some answers to that as well. Commissioner Marshman. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, Lawrence, for for helping to get things uh, organized um, and uh, giving us a few more pointers. My concern with the committee structure is with uh, the first one structure government and the third one um, basically the accessibility equity issues, new things that can be brought up especially if there's no communication among the groups, because there are things that, that those groups, uh, the third group could deal with and um, electing a police chief is one of the things that's been on a list and a, a couple of other things like that, that would totally change, I think, the way the rest of city government is looked at. And, you know, if you were going to have police chief and political office, you would surely make the mayor more powerful or, you know, not in that case, if you had a, a, a uh, city manager primary form of government, you would have the police chief as the most powerful elected uh, official in the city. And, um, and I'd also point to some challenges of, of this county and some other counties, which uh, now uh, uh, you have gone away from an elected chief. But, but these are things that have to be cross-pollinated somehow. I, I didn't think that was a serious proposal, but apparently it is. And there are some other things out there that may be serious that I think overlap with governance. Yeah, so I guess what I would say is, as we've started to look at the list of options, what I think the subcommittees will have to do is get a scope to be able to get our scopes first so that everybody has kind of a general idea of, what are the topic areas that the subcommittees are going to look at? And the commission's going to have to weigh in on agreement around those scopes to make sure that we aren't having subcommittees talking about things that don't connect to each other. But we have a real, we have real caution around subcommittees communicating with each other. Otherwise, we're going to create a serial meeting really fast. So one of the first steps in the subcommittee process is to really be able to tease out who's covering what and then let them go work and then bring back to the full commission. Commissioner Monley. Um, yes, um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. I just want to um, recognize the amount of work that went into this um, commissioner memorandum that was delivered to us today, but I'd like to respectfully object uh, to it being presented in this evening. We should not be receiving documents that we can't have an opportunity to read. And then um, I know we're not acting on it, I don't believe tonight, but having it be part of our discussion tonight, there's a lot in here and kind of a lot that um, needs to be digested by us. I really request respectfully that anything that comes from a commissioner or from staff, I think we've had this request before, but it keeps going on that we should have this well in advance of our meeting so that yeah. we can all have an opportunity. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Marley. And we are not taking action on the memo tonight. It's not on the agenda. If commissioners have opinions that are in that memo, that's certainly their prerogative to bring them up tonight. So. We're just commenting really on Lawrence's proposal, the consultant's proposal, and lots of you have ideas about that, including things that are in the memo. So we're not on the memo. I appreciate your, your, your piece. And I appreciate staffs uh, really being respectful of the guidelines we gave them after the suggestion of Commissioner Lazat. And we have been sticking to those timelines. But again, when, what I said before was when other notes from the public or anyone comes in off that timeline, you'll get them, but we're not necessarily, uh, we're not gonna be acting on them um, if they're not on the agenda. Uh, Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. So um, just on that piece, I hope that we can actually discuss this process a little bit more because, and, and um, 
my colleagues who, who are also on the memo should speak to it as well. But I see our, our role as commissioners is, is really to consider the staff recommendations first and take the lead from the staff. And so, you know, what, what we did was first look at what had been sent to us on Friday, not knowing what areas that we had been thinking about might be addressed in the staff recommendations already, and then worked over the weekend to, to be able to submit a memorandum in time for this meeting. And so I, I am actually very concerned if we don't have a process that allows us to, to take the leadership of the staff that we're really lucky to have and appreciate, again, all of the thought and work that went into the work plan. We need to be able to take that leadership. But otherwise, if, if we can't then respond to that and make proposals and alterations for more than two weeks until the next meeting, that, that really creates um, sort of a, a delay and a slowness in our ability to operate as a commission and to work. And it seems to me that the alternative is that we're submitting memos that um, we've potentially done a lot of work on that are going to be rendered irrelevant because they haven't been informed by what staff has done. So if we're trying to submit them in time for Friday, we wouldn't have known what, what's going to be put out. Right. So I, I absolutely understand the concern, but um, but really uh, wonder how we're supposed to provide leadership as a commission if um, if we're not able to to put out feedback on staff work and, and have that addressed in a timely manner. Um, thank you, Commissioner Matsumura, and I appreciate the hard work. And I was able to kind of get through the memo today. I I feel like there was a lot of work put into that. Um, the challenge I think that we face as a commission is the time delay. We're posting our agendas a week before, um, and then we try to work during that week to get you materials by Friday. So the, the notion that commissioners are gonna be able to digest information on that same day that they receive it, uh, again, we had talked about earlier that that's probably never gonna be able to happen for a full commission to be able to respond to it. So I, I appreciate the, the efforts I would, I, I respectfully totally disagree that it's irrelevant. Um, the notions and the issues that are raised tonight are things that we'll be working on as the, now that we have the council's approval, we'll get the work plan and you'll be able to, as you have the entire time of this commission, give lots of input into what we want to do. So the fuller proposal tonight was simply the beginning of this conversation. Um, and the next piece you'll get, we'll have both all the input that commissioners have given tonight, as well as the memorandum that you sent, and there will be a full discussion. Um, the other challenge we have is we have a number of speakers that the commission's asked for, and we've been scheduled to, and then we had additional conversation about council. So this would have been a longer conversation, but I, that's the challenge that we're facing. Mr. Masmora? Yes, just very, very briefly. So I wonder if we can work on methods to adjust that because I, I just think it's not going to be functional to to have a two week delay more than two weeks, as I said, the other piece is just for clarification, I do believe that this is agendized. So then it would be if there's a discretion from the chair that the chair is not going to accept motions, I do, I do believe that that's, that's allowed, but but we do have agendized the work plan. And this is this is commentary on the work plan. Yes. Commissioner Callender. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, I did want to speak to that. I do believe we do have the work plan in front of us. So I think some of the things that are spoken to in the memo are actually to address the, the work plan. And I have to say, I agree with Commissioner Marshman, where I, I am concerned about having smaller conversations with smaller work groups that we have never seen as a whole. You know, the, regardless of where, where you land on these issues, I don't want to give, say, Miss um, Marshall mentioned the uh, the police chief. Well, if we're going to have that discussion, I believe we should be hearing it as a whole in in terms of this entire body. Hence, that's what the basis of the of the memo was to make sure that we're all participating in these large decisions. Because I can't think of any small decision um, when you have a catch-all committee that could be potentially heard. That's not going to affect everybody. Not going to affect everyone that was uh, voted to be a part of this. A part of this and then we go and work it out as a small um, ad hoc non-brown act uh, committee that is not very transparent and then we bring it back 
and then expect to have a full discussion when it's probably not. I don't even know if the, if the committee be representative of all views. So, so the, w what I'd like to see, and I think this goes to the to the basis of the of the memo, is how do we make sure that we we rocket those discussions in front of us so that we as a body can have them as a whole. There's a lot of research that I like to do. In fact, one of the research projects I was going to ask for is to understand what police chiefs in the state of California and otherwise are elected and not elected. The extent of my knowledge goes to only the city of Santa Clara. Ms. Marshman mentioned that there were some that were elected that were not elected. I'd like to get that research and have that kind of presentation so that we can all be informed on these kind of issues of governance issues that would affect us in the other portions of the memo and things that could come forward versus just seeing it to a non-Brown Act minority of the committee. And then we get a recommendation back and we say, well, how did you, how did you get here? Thank you. Commissioner Calendar, can I just ask for a clarification? What do you see the role of the subcommittee would be uh, if it's not to, to further develop proposals to bring forward for discussion for the committee? Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Cordes. That's an absolutely good question. And I think what, what I'm saying is that we can't go off on our own and develop those without being informed with information that's coming forward to help to inform the entire committee. So right now, if those subcommittees would go off and would discuss things, and I don't know if Ms. Marsh Ms. Marshman is representative uh, is represented on that committee, how is she going to ask questions about whatever research is ultimately done and can't benefit from the discussion? So what I'm saying is that everyone should have the ability to, does this make the process a little bit more longer? This is why I was saying way back when, we need to get into these discussions quicker because here we sit on May 3rd and we haven't had full discussions on things that I believe, I'd like to hear how, what other best management practices are so I can form a reasonable recommendation to the council. Commissioner Lazat, then Commissioner Fuentes. The whole purpose of a, of a subcommittee is to do the work, the hard work, and then bring it to the full board. And I, I think I, either Lawrence or, or uh, Fred talked about the fact that the subcommittees are gonna have scopes of work. And that's what you're gonna be working on. And everybody's gonna see what your scope of work is. So there's not overlap, you're, you're, you're getting on issues, you're not missing issues. And then we'll do the research in these committees and then we'll bring it our recommendations to the full board so that they're to the full commission so that there can be an additional uh, conversation. But that's how subcommittees work. I, I mean, I'm, I, I wasn't in favor of subcommittees and now I'm hearing some people who were now questioning whether or not they're gonna be valid um, information given to the whole board. So, I mean, I think you need to understand what a subcommittee is about, how their work is gonna be informed by what the whole commission wants each subcommittee to work on. So there's no overlap. And the questions that we want asked as a commission are researched and answered, or at least a recommendation comes out of the subcommittee back to the co commission who then decides whether or not we're gonna pass it on to the council. I mean, it's just, it's not like they're, at, at, they're working in a vacuum. We're gonna be working as subcommittees with, a, with direction from the committee. Um, question of Fuentes. <clears throat> okay, my comment may be a little bit different. Um, um, for, first of all, um, I have several things I want to say. Number one is that um, after being with all of you and going through everything we've gone through on this commission, I really believe that equity is, if not the number one, one of the main issues that should be driving the work that we do. You know, in past commissions, it was like democracy, but okay, and I'm not gonna go into supporting or explaining why I think equity is so major to what work we do. Um, we were very fortunate tonight to get the presentation that was brief on the, um, the you know, from the equity team in, in the city. Um, we need to work very closely with them um, because they are, they, uh, what they presented was outstanding in my opinion because they really do have a framework. They've been doing the work and I hope they have the time to be a resource for our group because it's, it's essential. Um, we also need to, um, I think we need to ask more time for more time from city council. I mean, I don't believe that we can do 
the important work that we have before us in terms of thinking about the future of our city and what we need to do um, in the time that we've been given. We need more time and we should be asking for not more time. And I believe that that was, has always been something that, that we can do. Um, and then um, in terms of, of just our process, um, I mean, we need more time to call on everyone and to hear from everybody more than once. We hardly know each other. We, most of us have never met each other and it's very difficult to do this work to begin with, but then even more so. And so we really need to be able to hear from everyone. And I don't appreciate, I mean, with all due respect, I know that you have a challenge, but in terms of getting us through the, the agenda in, in a timely way, but I don't appreciate not being able to hear from everyone that has their hand up, even if they've spoken before. And um, let's see, there is something else I, I, I wanted to say. Um, um, I think that um, um, we need to give a lot more time to, um, to the proposal of our work plan and really think it through and especially passing it through the, um, the staff, the equity staff. I'm sorry that I don't remember the acronym, but the equity staff and have them look at it and help, you know, help us to improve it. I am concerned, uh, Lawrence, I don't know too much about your, your group, but I am concerned that automatically the outreach component especially is gonna be going to a firm that I don't know if they're qualified to, to help us really have a good, I mean, a good um, outreach and community engagement component. This is an expertise and this is an important area that we need to make sure that we have that we do it right and we do it well. And I even think we have to carefully look at the money that was given to our committee and make, and again, work with the equity team to see if the way we're using it is the best way because we're limited with the amount of money and we need to make sure that we're gonna get the best bang for the bucks. So um, anyway, those, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Tran, and then Commissioner Amador. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in terms of the, our approach to the work plan and how we approach the subcommittees, uh, you know, the, some of this is addressed in the memo that was presented by our fellow commissioners. Uh, and I don't believe it takes too much away from, from what we're focusing on, right? Uh, I, so my, my ask is this, uh, one is, I think we have to commit to the subcommittee uh, model one just because it is really impossible for us to get through this work without having some kind of division of labor here and without us having a little trust with each other to get through this work. Um, that said, you know, for the week, it, I think it is important though, and this is what I saw out of the memo that was presented by our fellow commissioners. If we can find a way for commissioners to participate or at least listen in or at least get access to the same information as a way for people who want that, does have that desire to get that raw information or get that presentation um, without violating the Brown Act. Uh, I mean, I think that's, that's important and, and it can be helpful. And, and uh, the big critical question is how do we do that without violating the Brown Act? Um, so uh, I, for one, am committed to the subcommittee structure because there's a lot of ideas input out there and I don't believe that it's, it's possible for us to go through all of that without having to split it up and, and trust each other in terms of getting some of this work done. But I, I do hear though that if we've got folks who are very motivated to actually dig in deep on every single proposal, I, I don't think we hold that back from them. I think we just find a way to allow them to do that without violating the Brown Act. Thank you, Commissioner Amador. Great, thank you. And I wanna just also echo Commissioner Fuentes um, on giving more time, not only just for commissioners, but I think for our public, um, you know, when we're talking about engagement, we wanna make sure that we are inviting and welcoming um, all of comments. And so I definitely wanna honor that and wanna make sure that we allocate after any speaker to hear their thoughts and to hear their comments before we comment on. Um, and again, I feel very rushed on this process and I know we don't have enough time allocated, but maybe it's time to ask for more time because 
a rush process is a process that I think we're not going to get to a proper solution and equitable solution. Now, when it comes to the equitable um, equity, the racial equity office, I think it's a great idea, uh, again, uh, echoing, echoing Commissioner Fuentes, but as just what uh, the racial equity office talked about, there's already uh, some toolkits that can support us and maybe as a as commissioners, we create our own toolkit that either we look through that lens as a whole or as subcommittees that we establish that before, again, deciding to go into subcommittees or being as a whole and that we present it into writing. So I think the way that I've seen this racial equity toolkit being used is that it's in writing and it's able to identify the impacts and the burdens that, it, that any decision is going to create moving forward. And it's not just... Um, it doesn't just serve us to see that, but it also serves the public to know, okay, we're taking this decision and we know what the impacts are going to be and we know what the burdens are going to be at. Um, so I just wanted to echo that as well on that equity toolkit. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Persson. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate everyone's comments and thoughts. I, I just wanted to say that, you know, anytime that a body like this, uh, whether it's a commission or a city council or Congress or state legislature, it, you know, that. The idea of breaking that those bodies down into subcommittees you have different trade-offs the benefit of course as people have said is that with a subcommittee you get more space more time for debate to really study and i don't think that precludes you know having robust debates when it comes back to the fuller commission and but i do think that adds to our understanding certainly um concern about our time um but we also have to consider that on the election timing issue we have an election next year in june and so I would also like to ask the city attorney's office about how much time would be needed to get the recommendations of this commission to the council if they went forward with a, uh, a, a recommendation to, to put this uh, that particular issue on the ballot, how much time would be needed in order to uh, comply with state law. So that's, a, that's an important factor to, to consider. Yeah, and I, and I can answer that question. So the uh, election in 2022 for June is on June 7th. And in order to submit a ballot uh, measure, we have to submit it to the Registrar of Voters 88 days beforehand. And we, of course, have to bring it to the council uh, for them to approve a resolution calling the election. And that all has to comply with our Sunshine Ordinance. Um, and then, of course, uh, your proposal has to be put into a resolution uh, that um, that could go into the ballot measure, and that that can take time as well. And it all de really depends on on what uh, uh, proposals you all put forward. Uh, so the December timeframe, uh, I believe, was put into place so that that would give ample time for staff and for the council to consider the recommendations and still have time to submit it for the June election if if they so desire. Um, I don't know 88 days off the top of my head, but I believe it's sometime in the middle of March uh, when we have to call the election. Count, uh, Commissioner Diaz. Yeah, I, I just want to take the time to, to thank actually the, the authors of, of the um, memo. I mean, I, I understand this. Uh, I actually think it's, it's great that they're doing it. And, and that's kind of the at the level that we as commissioners ideally we should be working and, and, and you know, this is how council works and how the other committees and bodies work. I think the issue is not everyone on the commission realizes that that's kind of something that we as commissioners can do. Um, that, that we're thinking in this way where we're, we're grappling with an idea on the agenda and like, oh, I actually think here's a, something we might be able to do in writing a memo to propose. So just getting all 23 of us on the same page that yes, you know, memo writing is something that we could do as commissioners and we should be thinking about items in that way and if we have something we want to share we should write it and if something's on the agenda um you know memos should and can be expected uh, to debate that issue that is publicly agendized um so um i you know i appreciate that and i, I hope that you know um, there's more of that to come uh, on the issue of, of subcommittees mark correct me if i'm wrong but I don't see the issue so long as everything the subcommittees discuss is like on Zoom or publicly available, right? Um, and so long as we don't have email sent to each other outside the scope of the public, if we're discussing like this, um, you can always have a committee of the whole. Is, is my understanding. I don't. I don't understand the the Brown Act concern so long as everything is available for public scrutiny. I guess that's correct. I mean, it, the subcommittee, the ad hoc committees are put together as temporary bodies of less uh, than a quorum in order to, um, uh, for lack of a better term, avoid the requirements of the Brown Act. 
The issue that we're concerned about is if people start going out of that group, then you have hub and spoke. But any type of coordination among the different subcommittees can occur so long as it occurs at a notice, um, a publicly noticed and properly agendized meeting. So if we just limit our discussions to whatever's over Zoom, like in this kind of meeting, and we don't have coffee at, at, you know, somewhere on the weekends together, and we don't email each other privately, we just restrict all debate and discussion to, to Zoom, basically, and the public has access to it, publicly noticed meetings, there, there should be no run act issue. Is that right? So yes, that's correct. So long as it's on a, a publicly agendized meeting and, and properly agendized, you wouldn't have a Brown Act issue. I, I don't want to speak for the clerk's office uh, and commit the staff resources to that, but um, as right. long as it's publicly available, then it then it. Oh, it's a staffing Brown issue. Act. I see. I, I, yeah. I got it. Okay, staff resources. Okay, yeah. never mind. If, right. right. If you're going to have a publicly noticed subcommittee meeting, we have to have an agenda, we have to have minutes, we have to have staff there. Got it. All right. Understood. Thanks. I, I wanted to add something on the time of the election. Um, I want to add on to what Mark said. If you guys decide to, to switch the mayoral elections, and so the next mayor who will be elected in 2022 will only serve two years or serve six years, that's probably something that needs to be decided before the nomination period opens in February. So, like, December is the latest you really can can do anything because it needs to go to council for their discussion and their action prior to the opening of the nomination period. Um, I don't know exactly off the top of my head. It's usually the second week in February. It usually happens sometime around um, pre President's Day, I think. It's uh, uh, Valentine's Day this year. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it's usually around February 14th. Um, so that, that like, December is the latest I'm comfortable because the council's going to talk about this for probably a couple of meetings. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to bring up that nomination period. Unless you guys are not recommending that at all, in which case that's different. Okay. So I'm going to conclude the conversation with a couple of... Um, uh, pieces around what I've heard and what we want to move forward on. Um, one thing I'm, I'll ask civic makers to um, talk about their experience and expertise and the additional scope of work that they're looking at as they present their plan. So I'll ask Lawrence to add that to it so that um, the question that Chris, Commissioner Fuentes, you're asking about their expertise or their record on this issue, they have experience in the issue. Um, we can, we can make sure that that's included in their plan. Um, we'll also look at the, the specific memo and all the comments that commissioners made today as we put together the next version of the plan. And at our next meeting, we'll have a full conversation, discussion and actions being taken on the work plan itself. But you'll see the more complete version, which is um, really detailing out the work plan for community engagement and the timeline around public hearings the public hearing process. I'll ask the clerk to also continue to give updates on translation. Um, and as she said, stated tonight that our next meeting will have interpretation as well. I'd ask commissioners to make sure that you talk to your district cons uh, constituents to make sure that they understand now that that would be a, a, a service that's available at our next meeting. So anyone who was not participating because of language, uh, uh, language translation, um, we'll be able to at our next meeting. And so I'd ask commissioners to make sure that you do the outreach in your districts to make sure that folks know that. Um, I'll also make sure that we have in our group, um, our scope of uh, work in terms of the subcommittees as we start to do the development of what those committees look like, that our first conversation and discussion is agreement on the scopes so that everyone understands the scope of work that individual uh, subcommittees are working on. Um, and that we'll have a, a a loop back or a feedback loop to report back so that not when everyone's work is done, but as we start that work, that there'll be a regular feedback loop so that folks know what the commission needs to hear from a particular subcommittee. It could be the recommendation of a subcommittee that there is a critical speaker or a critical um, uh, set of data or a critical piece of research that you want in your presentation when you bring back the template comedic, um, completed form, and you're saying, you know, here's the debate, the pros and cons, and here's the research we found. And it was the best way for us to understand it was to listen to this speaker, this slide deck, this TED talk, whatever it is. Um, and that could be in the presentation back to the commission. So the education side of this is not limited only to 
um, the subcommittee's um, use of the form, but really is to make the argument and make the case for what their recommendation is. And so education could continue in that way as we move to phase two. Um, I will continue to ask us to be uh, thoughtful on the process of timing. I do think the December timeline, I assume that the council is not going to be at, you know, wanting us to go beyond that. If the commission at some point gets to the place where we're just at a stalemate, we can't move forward uh, because there's way too much for us to cover. I think that's a different issue. But at this point, I'd ask that we continue to move forward as diligently as we can, um, considering all of the challenges around timing. We're trying to get you to our that break that naturally happens in the calendar that month to get subcommittees organized so that you would be able to use that time in your subcommittee work. That's still our goal. Um, there is conversation and discussion around police reform. That certainly is um, a number of you have asked about a subcommittee specifically in that area. That would be my, my example of where is there a critical speaker or critical speakers that that subcommittee thinks are the critical folks to uh, understand what urban policing issues are and what recommendations there are. There are some organizations in the country that are doing that specific work. So we may be able to hear from them as well. Um, I will definitely ask um, staff to meet, work with me on what is our process in terms of memos. Um, certainly agree with you, Council, uh, Commissioner Dieppe around um, the use of memos and the writing of memos, but remember we are not full-time council members. Um, these are volunteer commissioners. And so for those of you that can do this at your work job, uh, that really is just different than, than folks that are working differently. So um, I wanna make sure that we're respectful of everyone's time, um, but I'll try to figure out process-wise a better clarity around what our process is for handling memos and what the time frame will be when we get them and in response to our our Friday emails. Um, again, I thank staff for really, uh, maintaining those timelines. Um, and I'm not convinced probably that the argument around why we really need outside counsel is gonna fly before counsel, um, but I'll certainly make the case that um, representing the issues that you raised, um, I think that they, the challenges that the council and the mayor raised, I'm not sure they'll be satisfied, but we'll see where they go when, when clerk responds back. If anyone has any other ideas around specifically why the city attorney will, what specific tasks the city attorney will not be able to do, um, please let me know. I, I, I'd appreciate that so that we can complete our response back to council, which is the direction they gave around our piece. I wanna particularly thank um, the commissioners that worked with their city council members on helping us get the resources that we needed passed, both the rules committee and then full commission. That was really helpful to us. Um, and the work that made my job a lot easier to go before rules and the council to, to support the request for the additional resources and answer their questions, both from the mayor and our council members. So thanks to all those of you working in your districts. And that's the last thing I'll say is, don't forget you are the representatives of your districts. And so, Getting the engagement and, and the feedback from your constituencies within your districts is certainly a, a really important part of our community engagement. Um, and now I'd ask for public comment on the work plan. The clerk can call the first speaker. Robert Brownstein. Good evening. Uh, I had raised my I had raised my hand to speak on the prior agenda item, which was the city clerk's report regarding outside counsel. Uh, the chair chose not to allow public testimony for that item. There's two problems with the chair's judgment in that regard. The first is it makes a mockery of the whole idea of public input into this process, that somebody can only comment on an item an hour and a half after it's already been decided by the commission. And secondly, the Brown Act requires that public testimony be allowed for every separate agenda item. Uh, I think the clerk's report was a separate agenda item. So I would appreciate um, the city attorney um, clarifying the commission's, the way that the commission handles this. So I don't have to submit a formal cease and desist order to the commission asking it to cease and desist violations of the Brown Act. Thank you. 
Next speaker. Caller ending with 5140. <coughs> yeah, I, I just think that this city has to start getting back to the basics, you know, roads, <coughs> infrastructure, uh, EMS response times. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a problem here. Um, the, the city is misguided by almost everything. They want to put road diet, they want to have road diets, they want to have all these weird things, build these villages with only electricity, no natural gas. I don't understand. I mean, San Jose Police Department selling marijuana. I mean, they promote marijuana on their website. SJPD means San Jose Pot Dealers to me. You know, it's, it's disgusting. They used to bust people for marijuana. Now they're, now they're promoting it. And, oh, if you don't buy it from them and you're selling it, you're busted. You're growing it, you're busted. I don't even smoke marijuana. Matter of fact, I'm glad they made it legal. I'm benefiting with my tobacco stocks that I own. I'm just saying the hypocrisy of this city is unbelievable. And always wanting to increase fines. They want red light cameras that were made illegal because the city council and the uh, city hall in San Jose Police Department didn't have any red light cameras in and around where their offices were. How convenient that was, wasn't it? How hypocritical, double stand. And then all of a sudden they want to, you know, incorporate all these, you know, different groups of people. But meanwhile, they love giving tickets, fines, abusing their power. You've got this, the code enforcement coming around, making sure someone's fence is a certain height, even though it was approved already. You're trying to put a happy face on a real tyrannical government. And I, before I said it was fascist, it's actually Zen fascist because you make everything seem so flowery and nice. Look who we have working here now, and look at look. You know, we're raising these flags up above our city hall, representing whoever. Oh, we're lighting up the city hall. But meanwhile, look at what you do, and look at look at the downtown. That downtown is disgraceful. It looks like Detroit. I mean, the people from Detroit should come here and say, hey, what's the matter? You guys have all this money. You have a downtown that looks worse than ours. I mean, in my, in my district alone, there's burned out buildings, burned out, burned out strip malls, bur burned out homes, haven't been repaired for years and years and years. Really bad roads. I mean, third world, like, uh, you can't even finish repaving all these streets correctly because the, the rent. The next speaker is Roland. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chair. So a uh, point of order, I'm going to speak uh, to this uh, work plan item. I'd like to come back for 30 seconds uh, to discuss electoral cycles on the open forum. Um, with regards to the first um, commenter's uh, concern, I had the same issue and actually uh, emailed the city clerk. Uh, essentially, you're looking at a, a violation of government code section 54954.3 which requires that you do take public comment after every item. Now, moving on to this, I really want to thank uh, you, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Vice Chair, for uh, capturing uh, comments uh, by the uh, Detroit uh, commissioners about uh, general public uh, comments. Um, and I also want to uh, recognize Commissioner uh, Callender about his uh, approach saying, you know, let's go and, and do the entire thing um, uh, together as, as a committee. Now, moving on to subcommittees, I, I really appreciated the answer that, that you got from the uh, city attorney's office, which is correct. Um, but the fact is that other committees, uh, please mute yourself, whoever you are, other committees are very um, foggy area of the Brown Act. In some uh, counties, San Mateo in particular, um, are abusing it. Now, the way it works is that if a government body has appointed a subcommittee, it's binary. Basically, that subcommittee automatically becomes brown acted, and I don't know why I'm getting an echo here. Um, now, if the subcommittee is brown acted, you cannot piecemeal the brown act. That means you've got to follow every single section, including uh, taking public comment. And uh, uh, that concludes my remarks. Thank you.
Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, uh, thanks for going over old business uh, things and what we can be working on. Uh, Mr. Uh, Roland LeBron, uh, Bob Brownstein, and myself, we've all noted that, uh, you know, there can be a slightly different system to use for the uh, public meeting process to allow a bit more public comment. And, you know, there can be just simple procedural ways to, to work. And uh, it doesn't have to be a, much of a difficult transition. It, you know, it's been described, you know, there, there's simple... Uh, uh, good standards and good etiquette about, uh, you know, allowing the public to speak after each item, allowing the public to speak after uh, public presentations. Uh, it, it's it, it just a, it's, it's a more official, organized way to work. And uh, that's when I said subtlety before, that's the subtle practices that bring about, uh, you know, better, a better system of working overall. And it's, it's interesting how that uh, can work well. Uh, yeah, a good, it develops a good public system, I guess, <laughs> is a way to say it. And uh, so good luck in, in the efforts uh, to work on these things and what we'll be working on in the upcoming months. You really uh, put a lot in talking about equity tonight and thank you for that. And uh, so we got a ways to go and uh, just thanks for your efforts tonight. That was the final speaker. Thank you. And now we're moving to the next item, which is public comment on the open forum. So this is addressing the commission on items that are not on the agenda. Okay, the first speaker to raise his hand is Roland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I do want to talk about, I don't know why I'm getting an echo. Um, I want to talk about the um, uh, mayoral uh, the election cycle, um, which is not agendized, other than the fact that the Tony uh, mentioned earlier that yes, you do have a deadline of December to resolve the issue. So we discussing uh, two years, you know, six years, etc. And I would like to put it to you that six years is not reasonable. But then again, if you go two years followed by four years, and we somehow would have a very very good mayor, it would be disenfranchising that mayor by saying, well, you know, you served six years, you have two terms, your time is up. So what I would like to put forward to your consideration is a slight variation on this, is yes, the next election will be for two years. It will be followed by another four-year term. And whoever was elected two years from now will be allowed to run again for that four-year term. However, as an exception, that person who would have then been elected for two terms, one two year and one four year term, would also be allowed to run for a third term should he or she choose to do so, in effect, allowing them to uh, run as basically act as mayor of San Jose for a total of 10 years. And that's the only change I would make to what we're thinking about right now. Thank you. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thank you for the meeting tonight. Yeah, to, to work a good public process is addressing the ideas of equity, which is how I address equity. And uh, uh, it was nicely mentioned by a council or a former council person, Dieppe, that uh, maybe in San Jose, you know, compared to Detroit, we're dealing with more of a council uh, decision making process. And I can't emphasize enough my personal feeling that this this will be a, a decision about how to better create the idea of council and community. And uh, strong mayor ideas, what you uh, offered in your meetings a few weeks ago, are questions more of a specific charter question, what the mayor can actually do, that he's not being, uh, that just hasn't been written down in our charter yet, and uh, what what that and that what we've assumed that he had, did have the power to, to work out those small things, those refined fine things. I think that's hopefully what we can focus on, in San Jose, and to for the strong mayor to work towards ideas of of 
being in charge of large development and not talking to the rest of the council about such a process, you know, I, I'm, that is scary stuff to me. You went into a large bucket tonight of the ideas of equity. And, um, you know, that, that's, that was nice of you. you. You have a bucket saved for equity issues, uh, issues of reimagine, my own issues of what can be better accountability and open public policies for the future. That's about ideas of, of better democratic practices. I think that that democratic practice is a good lead to, you know, these sort of equity questions that you have. Um, you know, the future of streetlights, you know, it's not just people asking about streetlights, it's asking about the open public policies and all the technology and surveillance that will be in the future of streetlights. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a community future and good luck in how you're gonna. The final speaker is um, 5140. Hi, yeah, I can't say it enough. This city, you're trying all these new things. You really think that you're going to emulate another city? You guys couldn't think of this on your own to have better, better meetings. I mean, half the time you cut people off before they're two minutes anyway. Sometimes you don't even pick up my calls because I'm probably the most unpopular person at, down at City Hall and San Jose Police to pot, pot dealers, I mean. And, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see you guys changing anything. You're just trying to put a nice face on a city that's sinister. You sell out to all these real estate developers. Uh, you have a downtown that's just, I mean, it, it's, it's shameful. I mean, I can remember like in 2018, I went down there, 2019, this is before COVID. And it was the day after Thanksgiving. There wasn't a soul down there. I went to a mariachi festival that was fun. But uh, the down, it was empty, empty. You could roll a bowling ball. It looked like, it looked like we were in an economic depression. And that was the height of the, of the economy at the time. And, uh, but what do you do? You, you screw up the parking. You put up those stupid bollets, whatever you call them. I call them rubber baby bicycle bumpers. It's an eyesore. It's a waste of petrochemical. You have these you have these bike lanes all over the city that have completely monopolized driving, making it difficult to drive. I really want to slow people down, but this is not intuitive at all. Uh, the repaving program, I hope I'm alive when it's finished. And I can see my street paved. And you and the city never finishes the final work. On, on the on the repaving around the uh, manhole covers, there's always this you know four inch gap all the way around the manhole cover. People bike is not hey, good for bicycles. It's not good for cars. It's really bad for motorcycles. And it's it's just the tacky laziness of the 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 the, 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 the just. That was the final speaker. Thank you. Um, for the record, there was one item under old business, which is the um, the discussion of the possible actions on the work plan and public hearing was held on that item for, to include all the discussions that we had on that item. Um, I think we are adjourned. I believe I'm at the end of our item number um, eight, which means we are um, we're able to adjourn until our next meeting, which is in two weeks. Um, and so thank the council members, commissioners for their time this evening and apologize for going so late. And I appreciate you sticking with us. Thank you. Good night.